in an idyllic place, a mother disappears from the family home. Her kids had come home from school. She wasn't there. That was unexpected. The door was left open. She was meant to be collecting her child from school. She didn't turn up. Police were called to the address. Later that evening, Nat, the father, her husband, had been contacted. He was staying elsewhere at the time. Thereafter, uh, the investigation into her as a missing person began because it was totally out of character. Arlene Fraser, a family woman, had simply vanished. Nobody could explain where Arlene was. Weeks earlier, she'd been attacked. Was there a link? Arlene was just an ordinary mum. Why would someone attempt to murder her a month before and then she goes missing? In a case which frustrated detectives, a specialist lip reader used by Britain's security services, her identity protected, was drafted in to help uncover the truth. And to another point, he actually mimed drawing his wrist when he was talking about cutting up the bones. What had happened to Arlene Fraser? Detectives fear she's been abducted, murdered. And if she has, how will they solve the mystery? Every investigation is like a jigsaw, each piece offering new evidence as a picture of a suspect emerges. But which one will reveal the killer's mistake? Two hundred miles from Elgin in the northeast of Scotland on a blustery April evening, Carol Gillies is at home near Glasgow. Her life is about to change. It all started with a knock on the door. There was a policeman standing there from Strathclyde Police, and he'd said, um, your sister's been reported missing. Right away, I felt that was it. You know, Arling wouldn't go missing. She had two children that she loved. Nothing added up. At her home in Smith Street, Elgin, the minutiae of Arlene Fraser's life, including vital medication, were discarded. If she'd really disappeared and run away, she would have packed the medicine she needed for her Crohn's disease. She would have packed her spectacles. She wouldn't have left her door open. She would have made arrangements, you think, as a, as a loving mother for her child to be picked up from school. There were all these things that were very suspicious. A 14-year riddle of the mother who had disappeared had begun. What followed saw a cat and mouse game between killer and investigator. Would a murderer's mistake be uncovered in a story which begins with an inexplicable scene? It was as if she had just been spirited away. Some of her clothing was, was in the bathroom, just folded and ready to be presumably worn. It looked like she had been in the middle of some housework. The vacuum cleaner is plugged in as if she's just kind of stopped using it midway through cleaning. Arlene was a creature of habit. She had a set routine and she went missing on a Tuesday morning. Now a Tuesday morning was pretty much the only period of time that she would have been at home alone or known to be home alone by those who, who knew her. She went to college. She had uh, the kids obviously in the evenings and the weekends. So the period of time that she would have had peace at home was really very much only on a Tuesday morning. And then she always met a friend for lunch in the town. From looking at all Arlene's, our life and the way she lived her life, I mean, she, she'd been a mother for 10 years. Um, she was going back to college. Um, she was doing that on a, a Tuesday. She was trying to build up her, her own wee life. The kids were now both at school. There was a strangeness around the house, but it, it, there was no upset. There was no signs of violence. There was nothing knocked over. There was certainly no crime scene. It just looked like the house had emptied. On the day itself, April 28th, police had little option but to ask for all of the relevant forces to be on the lookout. 
and then alert the public of Arlene's disappearance. Perhaps she would return. First thing you might consider is that they've just they've just run away. Maybe they've run away with someone else. Maybe they've just run away by themselves. They just want to start a new life. 24 hours went by, still no sign of Arlene. The next day it was becoming a little bit more sinister in the sense that there was just no obvious explanation why Arlene hadn't come home. The practicalities of a mother who suddenly vanishes from a family home present an immediate problem for those called in to help, like what to do with two school-aged children. We collected the kids, um, Jamie and Natalie, and obviously they needed night clothes, the school uniform, etc. Um, they're both standing in the doorway with two plastic bags. They just looked so bewildered and so lost as what was happening, bearing in mind Natalie was five and Jamie was 10, you know. Um, for me, you know, that just rubber stamped it, that this was not Arlene's doing. There was no way Arlene would do this to her children, absolutely no way. She loved her two children and there's no way she would have left the children. She was going to run away. She would have taken the children with her. So I knew right away um, that Arlene was dead. Dead. Arlene's father feared she was dead within a day of her disappearance. When evaluating the case, it's important to understand why there was such disbelief that Arlene would simply run away. It would have meant leaving a 10 and five year old in an empty house because the children's father was not living in the family home. Nat Fraser, Arlene's husband, was someone investigating detective Alan Smith based in Glasgow knew all about from his days as a local policeman in Elgin. Understanding Nat Fraser becomes vital to uncovering a killer's mistake. My first uh, conversation with Nat Fraser, the husband, was probably a matter of days after I arrived up in Elgin. I'd known Nat from a previous life. He was a, was a local businessman. He was involved in the delivery of fruit and veg to local businesses. He was a popular individual in Elgin. Uh, he played in a local band, a music band at weekends. So he was a, he was a popular individual in the, t in the town. Nat Fraser was an incredibly manipulative man who could make friends quite easily. He set up a business, it was very successful, and, and none of these things go against his general personality. He wasn't one of those people who was a loner, who kept himself away from people. He, very much the opposite, he was out there, he was in control, he was the boss, he was the master of what was going on. But he was no longer master in his own home. Arlene had seen a solicitor. She wanted a divorce. Nat had beaten her. Charged with attempted murder, later downgraded to assault, he was living out of the town on bail. Nat Fraser had a very definite history that would have raised him as a potential risk to his wife. Some of the things that um, were reported about him and his behaviours would even, I think, have made him a high risk to his wife. That assault was very, very serious one. He had put his hands around her throat and, and threatened her life. The police begin to build up this picture of an unhappy relationship, one which she was trying to escape, and a potentially violent partner. But when his wife disappeared, Nat had his sympathisers. He was a popular man. When locals and the police asked about Arlene, Nat would answer, revealing how tormented he was. There's two sides to Nat Fraser. There's the, the public Nat Fraser, the, the, the hell fellow well met, the popular van delivery guy, everybody in the, in, in the town thinks he's a cheeky chappy, always cracking a joke, flirting with the ladies. That's one side of Nat Fraser. The other side that we began to uh, unearth as we looked very much more closely into him as an individual is that there was very much a dark side, a dark side to the private Nat Fraser. 
Uh, and what we saw there was, was, was quite alarming. He, he clearly had a history of, of domestic abuse. Arlene had been subjected to domestic abuse on many occasions. He was a controlling individual. He didn't necessarily have any real loving or emotional investment in Arlene herself. And there was strong evidence of controlling and coercive behaviours and violence. Knowing all of this, why was Nat Fraser not immediately a significant person of interest to the police? Irrespective of, of our hunch, you've got to follow the evidence. And the evidence that we had was very, very thin. We didn't have a crime scene. We, we didn't have any witnesses. We didn't have any forensic evidence. We didn't have any CCTV uh, that, that helped us. We didn't have any confessions. So we, did, we didn't have a crime. So our first challenge as an investigation was, is Arlene alive or has she gone missing? There was something else which deflected suspicion from Nat Fraser. He had an alibi. He was known to be out of town, delivering fruit and veg the day that Arlene went missing. He was accompanied by a van delivery boy. His vehicle was seen on CCTV at a particular location on that particular day. He was on a telephone call to a lady who he'd previously had a relationship with but hadn't phoned in, in years uh, and ironically never phoned again. So he made sure that he was marking his scent that morning. Detectives were in constant dialogue with Nat Fraser, but if something sinister had happened to Arlene, he had made no mistake to put him in the frame. She had gone missing, and there was nothing to say to the contrary. He was not a suspect for, for months and months and months because there was no evidence. Why had a doting mother walked out on her children? Was husband Nat involved in her disappearance? Where was Arlene Fraser? Detectives with little to go on in the hunt for Arlene Fraser simply kept a watching brief on her husband, Nat. His demeanor did not compute with what they knew had been going on behind closed doors on Smith Street. Nat's behaviors were odd around the time that, that she was reported missing. Now, on the evening that she was reported missing, he was staying with a friend and he had received a phone call that Arlene had gone missing. Now, in the context at that time that they were a couple going through a divorce and there was no love lost there between them, bizarrely, he went straight into the Telgen where she lived and within no time at all that evening, he was checking the hospital. He was showing all signs of distress and, and concern, which was completely out of character. After only a few days, he seems kind of very blasé about the whole thing. And he goes from being the extremely concerned partner to police actually having to contact him to give updates on the case. A few weeks later, he's making jokes to friends about, oh, the kids will get used to her being away and so on. Um, that's not the behavior of somebody who's genuinely worried about their partner and the fact that they've been missing for several weeks now. The media locally and nationally began to speculate, but not about Nat Fraser. Coverage focused on the mother who'd abandoned her children. There was a lot of bad press about Arlene, which was, you know, it was hard to, to read. There was talks of her being on drugs, which was just ridiculous, you know, absolutely ridiculous, um, about having boyfriends, things like that. Where were the stories coming from? None other than Nat Fraser. And of course, naturally, uh, those who know, know Arlene, that would make no sense. So he introduced some elements to, to, to create an impression that she was involved in drugs, that she was promiscuous, that she was involved in other relationships. He blackened her character. I think these things come with the territory, but at the time you don't realize that. You just have to, you know, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen sort of thing. So we just tried our best to kind of rise above it. But undoubtedly, this was part of Nat's plan to create an impression, plant a seed that Arlene was into amphetamine, into drugs, which was never the case because we were able physically to, 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 to get samples of Arlene's hair 
from a hairbrush post disappearance. And that evidence scientifically told us that Arlene was not involved in drug abuse. Similarly, the, the relationships that he suggested and others close to uh, Nat suggested she was involved in never came to anything. Detectives wondered why Nat Fraser would start these stories. As the months passed, Nat pushed a plausible story. Arlene had run away. It became vital to him that the picture he painted of Arlene was seen to be true amongst the community, including the police. Arlene's betrayal of her family was a story which Nat repeated to anyone who would listen. They believed, through fantastic propaganda by, by Nat Fraser and his close friends, that this woman had up sticks, abandoned her kids, disappeared, leaving him and the kids w w with a difficult situation. So she was being painted as a prior. Fraser embellished the story as the anniversary of her disappearance neared. Arlene had funded her new life with a stash of Nat's cash taken from his house. But Arlene's father, Nat's father-in-law, a quiet man, told a different story. I knew that Arlene hadn't run away, despite what Nat Fraser was saying. I just knew because she would have phoned me on the Tuesday, so I suspected right away that she had possibly been killed. And he had an idea of his own as to who was responsible. They always blame the husband in murder cases, so possibly Mr Fraser would be a prime suspect. Although I think there might have been one or two others up there. But uh, he was a suspect. And I think the police knew that, you know, they were looking at a murder investigation. By 1999, detectives were convinced that Arlene had indeed been the victim of a violent crime and was dead. But if so, no killer had revealed a mistake. They set about proving their suspicions in stages. First, that Arlene was not alive. The proof of death, which is what we were doing, the proof of death in relation to Arlene is about closing doors of life possibilities. So no activity on her bank or any finances for X period of time. No apparent interaction with pharmaceutical outlets for medication that she, she needed in the UK, not just locally, in the UK. Similarly, with her contact lenses, her renewable contact lenses, n no activity in that regard. Telephony, nothing that would suggest contact with friends, family. All of these elements had to be proved in a negative sense to be able to then say it looks very much like there's just no evidence that this woman is alive. Nat Fraser went about his life running his fruit and veg business around the town in and out of the family home on Smith Street. He maintained uh, an impression that he thought she had gone on holiday and I remember saying to Nat this is some length of holiday that Arlene's gone on and, and even then he tried to maintain, know that it was credible, she's gone off to Spain. And despite trying to reason with Nat that this is so out of character, how, how can you really believe this of Arlene? It, it just seemed illogical, incredible. But he couldn't but maintain that position because to give an inch would be a weakness in the sense of it would have, would have given ground back towards uh, where he didn't want to go. Arlene's father and sister, meanwhile, were finding it hard to cope. It was really difficult because one minute you're living quite a normal life, you know, you're just every day, you're going to work, you've got two children, you're doing your housework, etc. And then all of a sudden you, you've stepped into this really almost dark life, you know, when you're talking, I mean, the word murder, you know, you're talking about that, that's horrible. 18 months after Arlene's disappearance, some in the police had concluded there'd been foul play. And privately, some acknowledged that, that they had a suspect, the same man that the family believed responsible, the man who was about to face charges for the attack on Arlene five weeks before she went missing. 
Nat Fraser. There seemed to be no other theories possible. The question has to be who would gain the most from Arlene's disappearance. Now in terms of motivation, Nat had a huge amount of motivation to, to, to get rid of Arlene. And statistically speaking, um, when a woman is murdered, in about half of cases, it's a partner or ex-partner who turns out to be to blame. So Nat Fraser is going to be an obvious suspect. The number one motivation was that he was already awaiting criminal trial for her attempted murder just weeks before she disappeared. So freedom, if she wasn't there to give evidence, was, was, was obvious. The second thing is we knew that she had been in talks with her solicitor around about a divorce settlement, a six-figure divorce settlement, which was going to hugely damage him financially. Motivation number two, with Arlene out of the equation, he's not going to lose his money. If Arlene was no longer there, he would get back into the family home, he would control that, he would get back with the kids and control that. All of his finances, he would be back in control. So from a perspective of motivation, there was no shortage of motivation. Whilst there were still plenty of people in Elgin who supported the popular Nat Fraser, time was not on his side. By the second anniversary of Arlene's disappearance, there seemed no sensible reason to support the claim that she had abandoned her children and left home. It was only the passage of time, weeks, months, years with some individuals, before they began to reflect on the, the, the likelihood of this as being sensible. You know, birthdays had passed, Christmases had passed, the kids, she was a devoted mother. The one thing that we knew was that she was a devoted mother, and yet birthdays passed, Christmases passed, it, just, it, it was absolutely illogical. I mean, obviously, the, the police were getting information from all angles about Arlene. They would talk to her friends, they would talk to Nat Fraser, um, and most importantly, they, they talk to the people that actually, you know, really, really know her. But Nat had an impregnable alibi, and there was no body to confirm Arlene was dead. Neither Arlene nor her remains had been found. She might still be alive. So what charge could detectives possibly bring? If she had been murdered, they needed the killer to reveal a mistake. Nat Fraser, a suspect as time passed for something, but for what? A turning point in the case came when a key piece of evidence was uncovered. An Elgin mechanic revealed that he'd sold a vehicle to a friend of Nat Fraser. The case went very quiet, and then there was talk of a car being used, a beige Fiesta. We uncovered a significant break for the first time in relation to uh, a vehicle. And police were very excited about this, and I think it is relevant to the inquiry. And the Ford Fiesta had been purchased the night before Arlene had gone missing, the 27th of April, by a very close associate of Nat Fraser. In circumstances that could only be described as very covert, cash in hand and say nothing, there was a third party used to purchase the vehicle. Car was purchased the night before Arlene went missing and then it was disposed of. And so that, that vehicle, the whereabouts of that vehicle, sightings of that vehicle, really re-energised the investigation because we began to believe that the purchase of that vehicle was inextricably linked to her disappearance. And could that have been the vehicle that was enticed her out? Police had a lead. They summed it up like this. A car had been bought by a Fraser confidant the day before Arlene had disappeared and then it had been destroyed. It's very, very strange. Why would you do that? Other inexplicable evidence had been uncovered, like the mystery of the missing and then reappearing wedding rings. The initial 
crime scene examination of the house within a day of Arlene gone missing. The house was sealed and it was looked at forensically and including that forensic examination was a full video sweep of the house. Days after that, once the family had moved back into the home, one of the family members recovered from the bathroom three rings, Arlene's wedding ring, engagement ring, and eternity ring. But they hadn't been there during the course of the video. Now, bear in mind, Nat had had fairly regular and free access to the house at that point in time. So the belief was that the rings had been returned to the house by Nat. He was crazy to think that the police hunting for this woman who's gone missing, and even her family, wouldn't notice that the rings weren't there and then they've suddenly appeared again. So that really suggests that somebody has gone in and planted those rings, and he's doing it to support his story that she's just run off and she was trying to leave him. But you know, if she was running off, really trying to run off and leave him, surely she would have taken her rings and tried to sell them for money. It seemed such an obvious mistake from Nat. Why would he not dispose of the rings? Why commit the cardinal error of returning to the scene of a crime, so further exposing himself to suspicion? Alan Smith put it down to Nat's greed. As unbelievable as that might be, it, it is not that unbelievable if you understand how close Nat is to money and, and the value of these rings. And by reintroducing them into the family home was his way of being able to regain control of the rings and their value. Yet another piece of evidence emerged to further draw suspicion on Nat Fraser. His story about Arlene walking out on the family with Nat's cash kept in the house. It simply wasn't true. So his assertion was that Arlene had taken the money and disappeared and it was all part of the, the plan, her plan. But what he was unaware of was that days before Arlene went missing, she'd had humiliatingly had to borrow money from a friend for housekeeping. So she was low on cash. Now, if she had known there was a stash of cash in the house, she wouldn't have had to borrow from a friend, never would have. So that didn't square. And even if that stash had been uncovered post-borrowing money, Arlene would not have gone missing without having repaid her friend the money. So that whole staged piece of theatre by Nat to again build on the fact she's gone missing and ran off and abandoned her family, when you actually looked in behind that, that was a mistake. But there was still a big problem to overcome for police to prove that Nat was a killer. With so many sightings of Fraser miles away from Smith Street, home of Arlene, on the day that she went missing, how could Fraser be responsible? Police dug deeper into the part played in the mystery by a friend of Fraser, a man called Hector Dick. So Hector Dick was a business partner. It was Hector Dick who bought the now destroyed beige Ford Fiesta and may have helped dispose of Arlene's body. Nat believed that if Arlene's body was never found, there could never be a conviction for murder. So his real driving force, I think, was in her body disposal, her body deposition. In a rare twist at this point in their investigation, the year 2000, police had Nat Fraser exactly where they wanted him in prison. Whilst the investigation into her disappearance and possible murder continued, Fraser had been tried for the assault of Arlene, for which he'd been arrested in 1998. Convicted, he was sentenced to two years in prison. During this time, a third person entered the police investigation, another friend of Nat Fraser, a man called Glenn Lucas. He visited Fraser inside prison. Neither men knew they were being filmed. There was no audio on the tape, so detectives turned to a deaf identity protected lip reading expert to help uncover what had been said. Nat Fraser was doing most of the talking. And he said something about if a bones are smaller than that, he actually held up his hand. If a bones are smaller than that, 
They cannot be identified by DNA. The conversation between Fraser and his visitor Glenn Lucas seemed to confirm the prosecution case. Nat knew an awful lot more than he'd admitted. And another point, he actually mimed during his wrist when he was talking about cutting up the bones. And Lucas was saying, no, good idea. Please don't suspect you at all. Um, and stuff like that. And telling him that he hoped, he thought very much that Nat would get away with it. Whilst they didn't deliver hard evidence that was able to be admissible in court. What it did do was give us significantly interesting intelligence. And that was talking about how many alibis he'd had, how he'd been very sure that when he delivered, made the deliveries, that everybody had seen him. I could tell they were talking about cutting up bones, but I didn't know whose bones. I didn't even know that someone was missing, let alone dead. And that reinvigorated the investigation and, and gave us a number of lines of inquiry. The information given by the lip reader did not offer new evidence, but it did confirm the case against Nat Fraser and his harrowing crime. They were talking about a third party called Hackey um, and how much Hackey had helped him. There was mention of a car and a mobile phone, and I don't know what for how he had Arlene killed, but there was a mention of a third party um, who had offered or agreed to hurt Arlene for a price. By 2002, Alan Smith felt that he and the team had assembled enough to gain convictions related to the murder of Arlene Fraser against three men. Glenn Lucas was considered an accomplice to a conspiracy alongside Hector Dick, with Nat Fraser the orchestrator of the abduction and murder of Arlene Fraser. We had no hard and fast silver bullet, no forensic DNA linked between the victim and the, and the perpetrator. We didn't have the luxury of that in this investigation. Despite the absence of a piece of smoking gun evidence, Fraser, Hector Dick and Glenn Lucas were charged. What followed transformed Elgin from a delightful market town on the coast to the scene of complex legal arguments in court and the continued probing by police into what had happened to Arlene Fraser. Elgin and the picturesque Moray Firth became a temporary home to legal experts and senior detectives as prosecution and defense teams argued about, amongst other things, whether Nat Fraser and his alleged accomplices could ever get a fair trial in the small town. Eventually, it was decided to move the case to another town, Dingwall, 52 miles away. But four years after her disappearance, three men, including her husband, were due to stand trial for the murder of Arlene Fraser. The case was thought by some dangerously thin, but as the trial neared, one of Nat Fraser's friends turned against him. He thought that he could confide in other people and that they would remain loyal to him. It didn't occur to him that they would not be loyal to him. Hector Dick now offered to support the prosecution case and he made an amazing revelation. He claimed that Fraser had hired a hitman from down south, that Arlene had been abducted, killed, her body dismembered, and then her body was ground up and, um, and burned, and then her ashes were disposed of. He also claimed that Fraser had asked him to acquire a car to help with the abduction. Charges against Hector Dick were dropped, as were those against Glenn Lucas. At last, Arlene's sister could have her day in court to put the record straight about Arlene. She was far from relaxed about it. Nothing was certain about the outcome. Being a witness in a high court <laughs> is very, very scary. You know, it's really scary. Well, it was quite an experience because uh, it's, you're in the box to try to answer QC's to these questions and half the time, my hearing aids weren't working, <laughs> so it was a bit of a challenge. It's just not a nice atmosphere at all. Um, 
they have a way of doing things and you're, a, you're asked a question and it's a yes or no and you come away feeling very frustrated because they've asked the question but you want to say but you know um, <laughs> but no it's a yes or no so you, you, you feel kind of unfulfilled what would be the outcome had Nat Fraser made a killer's mistake would he be found guilty of the murder of Arlene Fraser Carol Gillies and her father Hector attended on the verdict of the court in January 2003, just three months short of five years since Arlene had disappeared. Nat Fraser was found guilty. The judge offered his opinion of Arlene's killer. The judge made it very clear that he felt that this was an evil crime. It was without any care for anybody else. It was planned, it was brutal, it involved other people, it even hurt, you know, his own child. So when the when the judge described him as evil, that's quite a big step to take. That's all that's almost saying there is no mitigation in what you did whatsoever. But if the people of Elgin thought that it was case closed, they were wrong. Nat Fraser would appeal and his conviction would be quashed. Well, today's the day we'll find out if the uh, police and prosecution have withheld evidence, eh? If they're allowed to withheld hold evidence. In 2008, after a series of court hearings, both in Scotland and in London, on a legal technicality related to the Crown's evidence about the rings found in the Fraser family home. There was a question, a technical question, in relation to the integrity of the chain of evidence and the way that those rings were handled by the police. And on the basis of that, uh, the conviction was quashed um, because the rings played such a significant part in the first trial. And that was devastating. It was devastating for the police and the inquiry team, but it was doubly devastating for Arlene's family. Oh, it was, it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And of course we were disappointed. We were bitterly disappointed. The quashing of the conviction for the whole family was just devastating, absolutely devastating. Um, the whole court process for each and every one of us was, an, it was just a living nightmare. It seemed so unfair to everybody involved. Buoyed by his success in winning his appeal, Nat Fraser reverted to type. The old Nat came back. He, it, it, it was as if everything had lifted and he was back to being the cheeky chappy in the high street in Elgin delivering his fruit and veg. He could not contain himself. And, and the family had to endure that. And it was hard, and it was hard. But uh, he, he reverted to type, Nat reverted to type. And so that absolutely was all the motivation that was needed, if any was needed. To, to, to get this train back on the track. Let's get this uh, investigation and, and redouble our efforts to get him back into court. Police and prosecutors reconsidered their evidence. It may have seemed easier to let the investigation rest, but detectives wanted to take their case back to court. And so he went on trial for a second time, and this, again, was the first time that uh, an individual who had a conviction quashed was re-indicted uh, and, and, and put on trial for murder for the same crime. In 2012, Nat Fraser returned to court charged with the murder of his wife, Arlene. Would the case against him once again convince a jury? Had he made a mistake? Or would the cheeky chappy win the day and walk free? We always remember sitting in a room. We could hear them saying, jury verdict, court three, jury verdict, court three. And uh, we way up the stairs we went, and I mean, hearts were beating, absolutely beating. She need not have worried. For a second time, a Scottish jury found Nat Fraser guilty. It was just, uh, the, the relief, you, you try not to be, you know, jump in the air, you know, you try to stay composed, but 
the relief is unbelievable, just unbelievable because the alternative was that you would just walk through the doors and it would have all been in vain. And you know, when in our lane would still be out there and that seems so unfair. Arlene's body remains undiscovered. It's somewhere out there, but the trial outcome did bring some consolation. I don't suppose you could call it joy, but it was a relief because we were down in London at the Supreme Court and uh, it didn't seem to be going too well for us. Uh, so I was, I was a bit worried. Nat Fraser was sentenced to life in prison for a second time. He will serve a minimum of 17 years. It had taken 14 years to bring him to justice. What was the key mistake which convinced a second jury to find him guilty? It was the crime scene itself which betrayed the truths Nat Fraser wanted to be kept hidden. If he was to be believed, the town of Elgin had been harboring a selfish mother who had taken what money the family had and then set off on an extended holiday to Spain having abandoned her children. But why would she leave behind vital medicine and her glasses? The unlikely claims by Fraser that a devoted mother would abandon her children, a wife who had already sought refuge from the abuses of her husband, did not ring true. Too many people knew too much about the nature of Arlene and that of Nat Fraser. Nat Fraser thought he'd planned the perfect murder, um, but what he couldn't do is erase people's memories. He couldn't erase the things Arlene had told her solicitor and her friends about their relationship. The fact that he tried to kill her previously. They couldn't erase the fact that she was a, a wonderful mother and that she cared about her children. And when she didn't turn up to pick up her children from school, that that rang alarm bells. That was out of character for her. So that, for many, is the killer's mistake which Nat Fraser made planning a story which asked people to believe that a doting mother and family woman would leave behind her children and for what it's worth, vital medication too. It was that which convinced police, two juries and her sister that Nat Fraser was guilty of murdering Arlene Fraser, a woman who nobody could believe would abandon her children. She wouldn't do that to her family and her parents and her sister. She just wouldn't, she, because she knows us. She knows how we would, you know, the grief, the worry. There's no way that she would put us through that, no way. He excelled at sports, built for battle. Jesse Matthew had the physical physique of a quintessential American football player. Large enough to be offered to play at the college level. When his college football days were over, Jesse stayed strong, popular in his hometown of Charlottesville, Virginia. You know, he was from this community. He played football in our local high school. He helped coach football in one of our private schools in Charlottesville. He was frequently seen figure on our downtown pedestrian mall. His first victim was 21-year-old student Morgan Harrington, abducted on a prestigious college campus. Eventually, Morgan would be found dead. Five years later, Jesse Matthew snatched a second student, Hannah Graham, from the same university town. We were against an apex predator who was comfortable abducting, raping, and murdering a girl. Detectives gather evidence until a picture of a suspect emerges. Which piece of the jigsaw puzzle will reveal Jesse Matthew? What would be the killer's mistake? It would have been really fun seeing how she turned out. I'm Morgan Harrington's mom. Uh, Morgan's not here anymore because she was abducted and murdered in 2009. Who would think our precious little Morgan would interface with a serial murderer in a nice town like Charlottesville, Virginia, and be taken down? Um, but that is indeed what happened. Charlottesville, 
a nice little college town. It was college towns that the serial murderer who had snatched Jill Harrington's daughter preferred when preying on his victims. In 2009, Morgan went to see one of her favorite bands at the John Paul Jones Arena on the campus of the University of Virginia, Metallica. Her father is Dr. Dan Harrington. She had wanted to be at that concert uh, for about six months before, they, uh, before the concert occurred. She went to go to the concert. I, I always have believed in leave taking. I don't just sit on the couch and say bye bye. I get up and go see them out. And she got in her car and, you know, put down her mirror, fixed her lipstick, and leaned out and said, 241, Mama. 241, a Harrington family saying. 241, I love you too much, forever, and once beyond forever. Morgan, a student at Virginia Tech, two hours drive from the UVA campus, set off. She arrived to meet friends before heading to the concert. When inside, she had an accident. Witnesses would later describe to her family and friends what had happened. We saw her fall on the way to the bathroom. You know, it's a concert and the lights are crazy and she hit her head. So by the time she got to the bathroom, she was bleeding from an open gash and she went outside in the cold and she walked around for 45 minutes. There's a rule at the John Paul Jones. No readmittance once you've left. Morgan was spotted, unsteady on her feet, outside the arena. As she began to feel stronger, Morgan messaged her friends, saying that she'd make it back to where she was staying in the student town. So she called a cab company. When she was picked up in the cab, she's going to her destination, and she realizes that she doesn't have enough money for the fare. She almost has enough, but she just doesn't quite have the full fare. The taxi driver is believed by several detectives to have offered Morgan a free ride home in exchange for some sort of sex act. Morgan is so offended, she jumps out of the cab, wants to be so far away from this person that she literally leaves that cab running. Morgan's friends return from the concert expecting to see her, but she was not where they'd agreed to meet, and she wasn't returning their calls. Morgan is quickly reported as missing. The next day, a search of the campus turns up a troubling discovery. And on October 18th, a lacrosse player found the ID about Morgan. On a bridge, on a walkway, something was wrong. We got the call that Morgan purse had been found outside John Paul Jones Arena. And I came in, uh, Dan was sitting here, and we were waiting for her. He said, oh, you know, Charlottesville police called, they found Morgan's purse and that was like the elevator plummeted because you knew if her purse was gone she would have been on the phone crying she w it, we would have heard from her so i said w where is she nobody knew in those early days that morgan had tried to get a taxi ride home so nobody suspected a cab driver in her disappearance, which was a mystery. She was officially designated missing. The Harringtons would have to wait 101 days for more news about Morgan. Morgan Harrington has hundreds of waves to jump at the beach in the Outer Banks. Help us bring her back. We brought in uh, external people to uh, search for Morgan. We had 2,000 people in Charlottesville who were searching for her. How do you speak about someone who is missing? I don't even like the word. It's not descriptive. You know, my, my reading glasses are missing because I'm careless with them. We were not careless with our daughter. She was stolen from us. The search in the weeks after Morgan disappeared was fruitless. Life got back to normal in Charlottesville. Nobody suspected 27-year-old Jesse Matthew, who was working as a cab driver in Charlottesville. He'd returned to his hometown after five years away. Morgan's life thus far had been one of middle-class surroundings, comfortable home. What of Jesse Matthew? He came from a devout Christian family in Charlottesville. His mother, concerned at his adolescent behavior, had moved him from the town to live nearby, but surrounded by Virginia farms and not the temptations of drugs and crime in the city. He lived in what's called the North Garden area of Charlottesville, and 
maybe hunted on the farm. It's important to remember that detail. Matthew knew the farms and fields which would one day be scoured for evidence of the missing Morgan Harrington. Once out of the town, young Jesse started to progress at school. Not academic, but big and successful at sports. He went to high school in Charlottesville. Uh, you know, he was uh, an athlete. Jesse came to understand himself purely in physical, in almost animalistic terms. He was this muscular, physically strong, dominant individual, and that's all he was. If you lived in Charlottesville, Virginia, it was not easy to miss Jesse Matthew. Tim Longo would one day become chief of police in the city. He got to know all about Jesse, the talented American footballer. For the life that Jesse led, size really mattered, and his strength would become a focus of the later investigation. Jesse was a massive figure. He was a large man, and I suspect uh, in, in uh, in those days when he was engaged actively in athletics, he was suspect, I would suspect he was uh, a very intimidating uh, uh, figure on the field, if you will. In 2003, the intimidating football player got a place at university. He didn't last long. Um, he then went to Liberty University on a football scholarship. Um, there was an, uh, an accused rape there that no one prosecuted. Inquiries are made about his relationship with this young lady. He says it's consensual, and he says that he didn't do anything, never forced anything on her, that this was somebody that he had a relationship, and it was consensual on both sides. And then suddenly, Jesse Matthew is gone. The 21-year-old Jesse Matthew had been a suspect, but was not charged. He was asked to leave instead. And the next term, Jesse discovers that there's always room at a college for another football player and that there are more women to abuse. He went to Christopher Newport. There was a rape there. This is a man who's moving from college to college, committing a series of sexual assaults on women. But this time, the campus, the college, it's all hush-hush. Nobody will talk. And they're not being reported to the police. The colleges are handling them internally. They all rely on privacy laws. They can't disclose the information for the sake and the privacy of the students that may or may not be involved. When Jesse Matthew gets rewarded for his sporting prowess, for his physical prowess, I think that he would not have understood the difference between exploiting that prowess on the sports field and explo exploiting that prowess with women to attack and abuse women. On both campuses, it appeared that one student had made a claim about another, Jesse Matthew, who had, in turn, claimed that acts of sex had been consensual. Matthew evades arrest. He is not DNA swabbed. It's no longer a university problem. They're able to perhaps tell that the victim, the student, that the problem has been removed, and nothing gets done. There is no thorough diligent police investigation into the assault of this young lady. There's something about the pattern of offending, the persistence of it, and the intensity of it, which suggests to me that this activity is all-consuming for Jesse Matthew. It is who he is, it's who he becomes, it's what his life is about, the pursuit of this quest to satisfy his violent and sexual urges. That is all he is. He shapes his life to facilitate the activity. It fits in with the more important quest meaning to his life, which is the pursuit of these animalistic, predatory urges. Jesse Matthew was a danger to women, but was not on the police records for rape, so he was still to yield his DNA to the US national database called CODIS. DNA is the detective's friend. With it, crimes can be more easily linked to an offender. Without it, rapists like Jesse Matthew can go undetected. He was yet to make the mistake of being arrested for a crime which required a DNA swab. So he was free to attack again. In 2005, Jesse Matthew had given up on being a student, but he was working in another university town, Fairfax City, Virginia. 
There are six college campuses within a 10 mile radius of Fairfax City. Matthew was a regular at university events, which allowed him to prey on undergraduates who assumed themselves safe, but who were not. Brian Harris was a homicide hunter for 20 years. He's been investigating the Jesse Matthew timeline. In September 2005 in Fairfax City, there was yet another sexual assault victim. It is as if he is a wild animal. All he knows, all he is aware of, all he is focused on are his urges. But she was a survivor. And the woman remembers enough to be able to generate an e-fit, so they are able to create a physical likeness of him. And he also leaves behind some DNA. The trouble is DNA is pretty useless unless the person who's left the DNA has been swabbed and placed on the DNA database. As his DNA was not on CODIS, the national database, no link could be made to Jesse Matthew. This was the eFit image and was what detectives had to go on in search of the Fairfax City rapist. Jesse was upset when teased by friends that it looked a little like him. Eventually, they'd all laugh it off. We have him getting upset at being recognised potentially in the photo fit, upset. Um, now that's not a, the kind of emotional reaction that you, you would anticipate for somebody that was able to do the things that he did, for somebody who is so predatory, so, so obsessed with, his, with pursuing his, his sexual and violent urges. He projected a public image of a playful, gentle giant. I guess there's no other way to describe it. He, he kind of had that image in people's minds, that he is not the kind of person this kind of spirit that's capable of something this horrific. I think that's what people felt. There are indications that this is not somebody out of touch with human emotion entirely. I mean, you just don't get people defending you if you are devoid of any human emotion. But the psychotic serial killers that we know don't get people standing up in their defense. Opportunity after opportunity to arrest Jesse Matthew for sex crimes had come and gone over a four-year period between 2002 and 2006. In 2007, he was back in Charlottesville working as a cab driver with a job on the side. He played football in our local high school. He helped coach football in one of our private schools in Charlottesville. Uh, he was a, a frequently seen figure uh, on our downtown pedestrian mall. He was well known. The journey from schoolboy athlete to college footballer via two campuses before returning to Charlottesville was complete. As the search for Morgan Harrington continued in 2009, nobody knew about his sexual predator past and about the rape in Fairfax City. The evening that Morgan went missing, Jesse Matthew was just the gentle giant who was working the cab shift on the night of the concert at the main UVA campus when Metallica were in town detectives would not discover for a long time that Matthew was working the taxi rank nearby. There was something else they were yet to discover. Morgan was looking for a ride. During the same time, Jesse Matthew has suddenly stopped taking cab calls. The cab company describes the night for Jesse as being extremely busy, constant call after call after call. But around 9.30, Jesse stopped answering. They couldn't get a hold of him. This is the exact same time that Morgan went missing. That piece of evidence would remain unknown for another six years. How, after all, would investigators have uncovered it? They would need to request the records to want them. They would have to suspect Jesse Matthew. They didn't. No witnesses had seen him with Morgan. No security cameras had captured the moment that he picked her up in his cab. Three months after being reported missing, a farmer living not far from where Jesse's mum had moved the Matthew family years before, broke the deadlock in the search for Morgan Harrington. Morgan was missing for 101 days before her body was discovered. It's hard to believe this, but having someone find the body is, is a blessing because otherwise they are just forever lost. And so knowing that Morgan was murdered was far less concerning to me than not finding her body. The body was actually a collection of bones, 
Clothing was also found. That was how police were confident it was Morgan Harrington. What did show up was her T-shirt, which was a, a Pantera T-shirt that uh, was very unique, that had blood on it. And out of that blood, a DNA match, a DNA profile was developed. And that DNA match matched other cases in years past, other sexual assaults that had happened. Specifically, the DNA matched that found on the victim of the Fairfax City rape. Detectives now knew that whoever had killed Morgan had raped the student in 2005. But again, without a cross-check on the CODIS database, the identity of the attacker remained unknown. A year passed, still no breakthrough. Metallica helped keep the publicity levels high in the hunt for Morgan's killer. They called Dan uh, two days after Morgan was abducted and said, as fathers, as fathers, we are outraged. How can we help you? Hi, I'm James of Metallica. Back in 2010, our band offered $50,000 to help catch the person responsible for murdering Morgan Harrington. If you've seen the person in this sketch or have any information about this case, please contact your local police or submit your information online. Despite the high profile of the crime, Jesse Matthew was still not a suspect. As the years passed, police and Jill Harrington knew that sexual predators who kill don't stop until they're caught. I was told early in the investigation that it was most likely, most likely, that Morgan's killer would be found from DNA on another body. During a press conference, I said it's too late for Morgan, but please, let's work together and save the next girl. Because I knew we, we were against an apex predator who was comfortable abducting, raping, and murdering a girl. And I didn't want him to get another one. An apex predator is defined as an animal with no superior in its natural habitat, the king of the jungle, unstoppable. Jesse Matthews cannot conceive of not succeeding in this domain. Uh, he always has succeeded when he, he's applied himself physically. Uh, his understanding of women and of, and of uh, how to satisfy his sexual urges are such that the only route open to him is to continue to persist and to use force. And I do feel that there is such a thing as a predator. Predator is just probably the best characterization one could provide. This person is in this town. He's, in, he's a local boy. This is homegrown talent. He, he is comfortable here and predators stay where they're comfortable. Matthew, after Morgan's murder, did stay on in Charlottesville. Again, ironically, a year after she had been killed, Matthew was arrested. It would be another near miss in the search for Morgan's killer because he was not asked for his DNA. In 2010, Jesse Matthew is arrested for criminal trespass. It's not an offense where a DNA sample is required. It's a misdemeanor offense. It's like getting a slap on the wrist. So who knows that day that he was arrested for criminal trespass, what Jesse Matthew, what his intent was. Still without Matthew's DNA, there was no forensic evidence to link him to any of the sex crimes. And without witnesses to his attacks or images of him captured on security cameras when on the prowl, he was free to attack again. And that was what the predator planned. Early one morning in 2014, Charlottesville Chief of Police Tim Longo received a call. I was in Texas teaching a class to a group of police officers and I got up one morning and there was a, uh, an email from a mother from Northern Virginia. And I'll paraphrase the email, it basically said, Chief Longo, help find my daughter's friend. I didn't know what she was talking about. I, I had just gotten to Texas. I wasn't aware of what had occurred over the weekend, so I quickly called home to find out that uh, a 19-year-old University of Virginia student uh, had come missing over the weekend. By the end of the day, I had made a decision I needed to come home and meet two people that I would come to know, and uh, John and Susan Graham. The Graham family was British, working and studying in the United States, and their daughter Hannah was the young student who had gone missing. This one particular night, she went out with her friends. She was celebrating. She had a few drinks. She went to one bar and another bar. At the same time, this very same night, Jesse Matthew, he is also out 
and he is also bar hopping. There's an ongoing debate about the use of security cameras in towns and cities. Charlottesville has few in public spaces, but it does have a lot of cameras in private spaces like stores on the downtown mall in Charlottesville. Jesse Matthews Knight was about to be captured on camera. His well-known figure would register in the worlds of a lot of witnesses. He went to at least three different bars. At each bar, every bartender, all the employees still remember Jesse Matthew. Why? He was a nuisance. He was hitting on women. He was making inappropriate comments and advances towards numerous women that they complained to the bartenders and the waitresses. Jesse Matthew, what was his reply? That he was out to pick up women. A few streets away, Hannah Graham was figuring out how and where to meet up with friends. Hannah Graham, unbeknownst to her, her path would cross with Jesse Matthew. Her friends had previously offered to give Hannah a ride. She didn't want to be a trouble to anyone, so she said she would walk. But Hannah was confused, she got lost, and even texted that she was disorientated and that she didn't know where she was. She's 19 years old. Bright, talented, but 19. You know, I worked very hard in the early stages of this investigation not to allow the image of this sweet young girl to be tarnished because of the decisions that she may have made that night, whether it be alcohol or something else. I don't think she deserved that. I don't think her family deserved that. And I worked very hard to make sure that uh, we didn't paint that image. But the reality of it is, she is a 19-year-old girl. And uh, she made her own decisions that night. And uh, I'm not going to second-guess those decisions. She was somewhere around 14th Street. This is where it is believed Jesse Matthew picked her up. Witnesses later said that they heard a woman scream, No, I won't get in that car with you. Hannah never met up with her friends did not appear the next morning. So that began an investigation that, that day when I met John and Susan Graham that uh, launched what would come to be the largest ground search in the history of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, we spent uh, many, many days, uh, first in the city of Charlottesville, which is about 10 square miles. Over a thousand people were involved in the search for Hannah. They scoured numerous areas of town. And then uh, in concentric circles, began moving outward. Uh, into Albemarle County, which is our neighboring uh, jurisdiction, some 700 square miles here. The Beta Bridge is an iconic place at the University of Virginia. Students are encouraged to express themselves by writing on it. Volunteer groups use it as a place to issue rallying cries for helpers. Hannah had been part of one of those groups. At another bridge nearby, her family and those of Morgan Harrington would one day meet. The anniversary of Morgan's um, death occurred during the time that Hannah was missing. And uh, we had, um, as we did every year, had a um, memorial ceremony at the bridge, and we had uh, media there, and uh, the Grahams were there. The University of Virginia um, was also there. As teams of detectives and volunteers search the woods, fields, and farms throughout the county beyond Charlottesville, Chief Longo and his team set about talking to witnesses, combing through what security footage they could find. Thanks to some video surveillance footage that we discovered on our downtown pedestrian mall, where uh, we believe that Hannah was abducted by Mr. Matthew, we were able to discern his image. It was the turning point in the hunt for a killer. All of a sudden, they had pictures of Jesse Matthew. And it was interesting, of course, at that time, he had dreadlocks and a heavier beard. And one morning, I looked at my Facebook, and this woman had messaged me, and she said, I worked with Jesse Matthew, and here is a picture of him from six years ago. When you looked at the, the composite, and they were exact, I, I was stunned. There is a lot of evidence which establishes that Matthew's victims fought for their lives. While this is going on, Jesse Matthews shows up to work with a swollen jaw. Witnesses tell police that actually Matthew has had a swollen jaw, which they think is a bit suspicious. He says it's toothache, but possibly it's a sign that his victim has hit him, and that's, that's the cause of the swelling. This causes people to reflect and think about, could this be the guy? 
no different than when you think back to Fairfax City and those original composite sketches when Jesse Matthew, his own co-workers, looked at those composite sketches and would tease him, telling him they look like you. Suspicion of Jesse Matthew was building. The guy with the unmistakable physique was all too clearly walking along the mall with the young woman who'd gone missing. Police now wanted to talk to Jesse Matthew. The way we were able to develop sufficient probable cause to obtain an arrest warrant for him uh, for abduction. Once the warrant is obtained, when they go inside the apartment. They also check his car. Two vital DNA finds are made, including Hannah's on the passenger side of Matthew's vehicle, proof that she'd been with him, and then a second DNA find. And they recover a pair of shorts, which they later find traces of his DNA and Hannah's as well, which is extremely incriminating. That swab they did on his car door, they also find Hannah's DNA, which places her in his car. He doesn't even try to hide the shorts that have Hannah's DNA on it. Something that many killers would do, would be very aware of doing, uh, but so primitive, so predatory is, is Jesse Matthew that he doesn't, he's not even aware of, he's not considering detection. He's simply focused, like an animal, on the pursuit of his immediate urges. The shorts and other materials are dispatched for analysis. They have a lot of incriminating evidence, but it needs to be processed. It has to go to a lab. But it takes over a week for those results to come back. In the meantime, the detectives have spoken to Jesse Matthew. He has not given his DNA. He has denied any kind of involvement. We were not in a position to detain him at that time. Uh, so he was free to leave, and in fact, he did leave. Matthew decides to get out of town quick. And then he disappears, just like he disappeared from his two football teams. He's gone, and he's in the wind. He, in fact, left the Commonwealth of Virginia. He made his way to, uh, to Texas. Had Jesse Matthew, the killer, made his biggest mistake? The ever-increasing use of surveillance cameras had put him in the frame for abducting Hannah Graham. What had he done with her? The seriousness of the allegations against him would mean officers could now obtain his DNA. Would that finally reveal his crimes? Whilst detectives awaited the return of forensic tests, he was on the run in Galveston, Texas. A month after being seen on the downtown Charlottesville Mall with Hannah Graham on the night that she went missing, the runaway Jesse Matthew was caught. On our beach in Galveston, Texas, a woman saw his image, saw his face, and recognized him. And so she called the Galveston Sheriff's Office and she said, I think I know this guy. Matthew was arrested and soon, via video link, being processed for a return to Charlottesville. Are you Jesse Matthew Jr.? Yeah. Mr. Matthew, my name is Judge Henry. You have two charges this morning. You have got a fugitive from justice warrant out of Virginia for abduction of a person with intent to defile. You have got a Galveston County charge of false information to a peace officer. Do you understand that? <laughs> Those who knew him or of him in his hometown reacted with skepticism. A lot of people in this community would have said to me early on in this investigation, you have got the wrong guy. There's no way in the world that this guy could have committed this offense. He was well known, and there were people who just said, you know, Chief, <laughs> you're barking up the wrong tree. On October 18th, 2014, in a wooded area rarely visited by anyone, and not far from where Jesse Matthews had lived after his move from downtown Charlottesville, the body of a young woman was discovered by one of the search teams. It was about 10 miles out where we discovered the remains of Hannah Graham behind a, a house that actually had been for sale for some period of time. When discovering both of the bodies of Morgan and Hannah, detectives and analysts were struck by the unusual ferocity of the attacks. The level of violence that, that Jesse inflicts on these young girls is horrifying and it's extreme and excessive and unnecessary level of violence. 
even in the most horrific of sexual and violent offences, we get some attempt by the offender to relate to the victim in some way or another, to some, even some acknowledgement of their humanity, but we're not getting that at all with Jesse. We're not even getting any acknowledgement of the possibility of being detected. He arrogantly is, is using the same MO. There's fairly strong evidence to suggest that Morgan fought back. When her body finally was recovered, her bones, her skeleton revealed, um, her ribs had been broken, her arms had been fractured. It suggests that she was trying to fight back. There doesn't seem to be any particular um, positioning of the body. His offences uh, and everything that he does within the offences are simply expressions, are extreme expressions of his violent and sexual urges. Detectives considered the evidence. Jesse Matthew is in custody. He has charges, basically kidnapping against him. As each piece of that jigsaw puzzle is flipped over, we're getting that clear portrait, and the portrait is Jesse Matthew. But the investigation's not over. They know who they're looking at. They gotta fill in those pieces. Whilst he was in custody, detectives detailed their case. He was very openly interested in Hannah Graham. That was clear by that video that depicted him walking one way and her walking another. And very quickly thereafter, the image of the two of them together. In the time that he spent with her, brief as it was on the downtown mall, they were seen in a local bar and restaurant. He purchased two drinks, presumably one for himself and, and the other for Hannah and then he was last seen leaving the mall in her company. Having established he was the last person seen with Hannah, investigators now turned to the forensic evidence. First, the shorts found in his bedroom. On those shorts was semen that belonged to Jesse Matthew. Which means they can generate a full profile and match that DNA profile from Jesse Matthew, both to Morgan, to Hannah and to that Fairfax rape all those years ago. To say that it was a breakthrough in the Morgan Harrington investigation would be an understatement. Those puzzle pieces that were flipped out on that table, they're flipping them over. And certainly that forensic evidence not only connected Jesse Matthew to Hannah Graham's death, but uh, to the death of Morgan Harrington and to the violent sexual assault of a, uh, a woman in Fairfax City uh, many years before. They know that Matthew's DNA was on the shirt worn by Morgan Harrington. And when they did eventually recover her shirt, they found some DNA on there, some blood, which possibly came from her assailant, and maybe it came from a scratch or from a, a bite or something. It suggests that she was fighting for her life. Many years had passed uh, since Morgan's disappearance and the discovery of her remains. Uh, and frankly, it was a mystery uh, in our community and. Uh, perhaps across this country as to who was responsible for the death of Morgan Harrington. And to be able to bring that case to closure was a, uh, was a milestone. Would the killer's mistake of being captured on camera lead to his conviction? Virginia is one of 47 states in America which allows defendants to offer a so-called Alford plea. Matthew chose this route when facing charges in Fairfax City. He did not plead guilty, but would not contest the charges of rape against him. I think the evidence against Jesse Matthew had this case went to trial was overwhelming. I got to think that one of the reasons why he took the Alfred plea that he did in Fairfax City was there came a point in that trial, I suspect that he realized that the government's evidence against him was more than sufficient to, uh, for a fact finder to return a verdict of guilty. Next came his appearance in court for the murder of Hannah Graham, seen on camera with Jesse Matthew. They're flipping over each piece and they're getting a clearer picture. And who do they see? That jigsaw puzzle with all those pieces being flipped over is a portrait of Jesse Matthew. The Hannah Graham case was just so clear that they had pictures of him with her, and so immediately it was a death penalty case. But Morgan's case, they had still not charged him with Morgan's death. And so finally, after several months, they charged Jesse with Morgan's death, and, and we went to an arraignment in Charlottesville. Matthew again offered an Alford plea. The big distinction between that plea of guilty in Fairfax City and his guilty plea here in the county of Albemarle was to hear Jesse Matthews say when asked the question, and are you pleading guilty because you are in fact guilty? To hear him say yes, 
clearly admitting to the murder of these two women was, um, it, it was uh, an incredible moment for their family uh, and, and certainly for this community to hear him accept responsibility for those horrific acts. Jesse Matthew got seven life sentences to be served consecutively, not concurrently. He yielded any chance for parole or geriatric release, any reason for early release, good behavior or whatever that might mean at a supermax prison. He's serving in the far corner of the state in a supermax. It's called Red Onion. It's a fairly notorious, isolated, hardcore prison. I'm told that he spends almost 24 hours a day in his cell, and that may remain the case. In most investigations, a killer is revealed as having made a number of errors, but there's always one which proves pivotal as detectives piece together their case, which was Matthew's mistake. It was to give police enough of a chance to collect his DNA, which he had avoided doing throughout his predatory criminal career. He had escaped being charged after a campus sex attack in 2002 because there had not been enough evidence, and again in 2003. And you know, in those early cases where he was sexually assaulting women, they weren't reported to the police, and so they weren't really investigated. And maybe that's why he thought, I can just do this. No one's reporting me. I can move on. I can offend again. He got greedy. Um, but as his offences escalated and became more serious, so did the resources towards tracking him down. And he was leaving DNA each time. All it then took was for him to slip up become a person of interest for the police to take some of his DNA. He essentially got away with attacking women. Um, the endless advances that we know he made alongside these, um, these essentially endorsed, they reinforced the pattern of offending. This is somebody who already had an overinflated sense of self-importance, a sense of invincibility, and there he is getting away time after time with these attacks on women, it was a dangerous precedent. But he was not invincible. He made mistakes. All of the near misses from justice came home to roost because Matthew forgot the role played by cameras in modern towns and cities. CCTV cameras capture her movements pretty much minute by minute. They also capture Jesse Matthew and place him with her. It just made sense that video surveillance technology would be one of many ways in which to provide a safe environment for those who would come and enjoy uh, downtown Charlottesville. And we had been making that plea to, to the local governing body for, for some years. And frankly, there was a lot of resistance, not just by the governing body, but there were some citizens that were uh, resistant against the placement of video cameras, even in a public square. I think it became clear to many people in the aftermath of this, uh, this terrible series of events, how important uh, such equipment could be. In no other case, the retrospective investigation of, uh, of, a, of a criminal offense. It was very, very critical piece uh, in this investigation. And it was one that almost certainly saved lives. If Jesse Matthew hadn't been caught, uh, he would have continued offending and the rate of offending would have increased. Um, this is somebody who, this was his life and and every time he got away with it, it just reinforced his commitment and his belief in the rightness of what he was doing. Jesse Matthews is a predator. I think predators are different stuff, but predators have to pass in the environment where the prey is because that's what they do is they hunt prey. If you look at the footage on the downtown mall when Jesse Matthews saw Hannah Graham, in three strides, he went from Fat Albert to Cheetah because he, has to, he had to assume the guise of Fat Albert and, you know, just a big, gentle giant. But given the chance, he reverted to his, his real stuff. Being spotted on camera with a girl who was reported missing began a train of events which has left Jesse Matthew in a cell for the rest of his life. I've actually measured it out in my home, uh, just how small a space he has. 
and for a man his size, he could take two and a quarter steps. Large steps, but that's all. I think the walls are concrete. It must be miserable. I say it's no different than if there was a rampaging bear in our neighborhood. People are not safe with the bear in the neighborhood. People are not safe with Jesse Matthews free and loose in the world. And he will never be that again. Every investigation is like a jigsaw, each piece offering new evidence as a picture of a suspect emerges. But which one will reveal the killer's mistake? If a guy like Kent McGowan wants to kill you, he's going to kill you. He just managed to do it under the color of law. I guess this one. 911 County, what's your emergency? They are trying to break into my house, please. So Kent McGowan, he was charming. He was likable. He was obsessed with being popular. Uh, and who is Joseph Kent McGowan? Who are you? Who am I as a person? Well, an innocent man, that's for sure. This was his chance, his chance at being that super cop that he always wanted. Oh, please. What are they doing? They're just broken, okay. I said, drop the gun, drop the gun. Ma'am? It looked like a clear case of self-defense. So to send Officer Kent McGowan to prison, investigators would have to uncover a killer's mistake. Old Oaks, Harris County, Houston. This road was the scene of a violent death. Homicide is not what you'd expect here. People are wealthy enough to pay for police cars to patrol the neighborhood. This way you have a fully certified Texas peace officer with full arrest powers that can conduct traffic stops, arrest people, and has the full authority to truly protect you in that neighborhood. It's an excellent concept. These are the guys driving around providing a visible police presence, particularly in a very affluent suburb like Old Oaks. Guys like Officer Kent McGowan. He sees himself as more than a patrol car policeman issuing tickets and keeping an eye on big houses. He is someone who has spent his life dressing to be an authority. He has ambitions. He wants to be a celebrated detective. We know Kent McGowan is a man who likes to wear a uniform. He was in the Air Force. When he leaves, he begins volunteering as a police officer. It's not often that the Texas Correctional Facility Authorities and the prisoners inside agree to a TV interview. Joseph Kent McGowan did. A career cop, this is not where he saw himself ending up. To be honest with you, when I was a little boy, I despised bullies, thieves, and liars. I always had, to, as a little kid, I had this issue with bad guys. And I just kind of, that was the trail which life led me. And that's, that's, that's why I went to the Air Force when I was, <clears throat> excuse me, 17, because that was about the, um, the youngest place you could be a policeman. Officer McGowan's beat, Hold Oaks, not the sort of area which will yield him the opportunity to excel to be a hero cop. He has the S on his chest as if he's Superman, the cop's cop. Brian Harris spent decades as a top homicide detective in Texas. He knows how policing works and the level of experience that an officer is expected to have for each assignment. 
He was assigned what's called a contract, his beat, basically. Very quiet. Not much police action is going to take place there. But he is assigned there until he gets enough time on and seniority where he can put in for another assignment, whether it's investigations or to a more crime-ridden area. But that's the area where he's there, patrolling. And there's not much crime that happens in that neighborhood. So little chance for Officer McGowan to make his name until the events of a humid weekend in Houston take unexpected turns. Deputy McGowan is patrolling this relatively quiet neighborhood, but at the same time, his ear is to the ground. He probably knows, okay, who are the little troublemakers? Who are the ones that get in trouble, etc. Officer McGowan pulls over a young man called Michael Schaefer. And so he makes a traffic stop, and the kid is scared. The patrol officer senses an opportunity to get himself an informer. If Michael can tell McGowan something useful, he'll let him go. And he starts inquiring. I hear there's stolen guns going around. Michael, nervous, anxious to avoid getting in trouble with the police, offers to help the officer. Kent McGowan now has his informant. Every good officer needs an informant on the streets, even in leafy old oaks. So now you have Michael. He's just a kid, teenager, barely an adult in the laws of Texas. But what can Michael tell Officer McGowan as an informer? He feels pressured, so he go turns to his friend. Hey, do you know where I can get a gun? And Jason gets him a gun. Jason Aguilar, 17, is no stranger to trouble. Jason's no angel. He's not a choir boy. McGowan arrests Jason, and here's a story which then escalates what had been an arrest for a traffic misdemeanor into something completely different. Jason Aguilar told me when we were working, he said, hey, I can buy you a fully automatic laser sided Uzi for $3,000. And at the time, a bunch of automatic weapons were showing up in that area, some drive-bys and whatever. And he told me for three grand, he could sell me a fully automatic with some guys he knows. Officer McGowan's case is getting bigger. Jason is going to spend the night in a cell. Earlier, his mother, a lady called Susan White, had left this note. Call me if you need me. I love you. A mother's love was about to show itself. She heads to the police station. When she comes over there, she goes, I need to talk to my son, whatever. I say, hey, he's going to jail. He'll be able to call you in a few hours. She was clearly intoxicated. Officer McGowan wasn't about to negotiate. It looked to him like Jason could be part of a gunrunner's ring providing Houston's underworld with Uzis. It's an opportunity for recognition and potential promotion. And it had fallen right into Officer McGowan's lap. What better way than to stand out to your supervisors, to stand out to the sheriff or whoever are your bosses than to be this super cop, this great cop, or even to the neighbors and the people you serve in that community, to be the one that's crushing crime, crime that they didn't even know existed in their neighborhood. He tells his colleagues, I've got evidence here of a gun cartel operating in this suburb. I'm going to crack it. The day after Kent McGowan had arrested Jason, there was a further sinister development. He hears that Susan White had threatened Michael in phone calls between her and Michael's mother. She starts saying, do you know Michael Schaefer? He's a snitch. Don't you know what happens to snitches? Don't you watch TV? In Houston, snitches get killed. Those are the exact words. She told me she's a freaking nut, is what she said. She's a nut. She's crazy. And then I said, I said, do you think that she's capable of killing your son or having your son killed? Yes, I do. And I said, we're going to go ahead and pick her up on a, on a retaliation warrant. She said, good, get her off the street. He interprets a general conversation as a specific threat and then goes from people can get killed to you can get killed. In McGowan's mind, he now felt certain that he should get an arrest warrant and fast. My name is Jim Mount. I was formerly employed as an assistant district attorney in Harris County, Texas, and I was one of the prosecutors who was involved in getting a warrant for Deputy McGowan. I prepared an affidavit in support of an arrest warrant for Susan White's arrest on a retaliation case. So he met me 
about three o'clock in the morning uh, at a division of the DA's office called Intake and he and I spoke and based on what he told me I prepared an affidavit that he swore to is true and correct. A traffic misdemeanor had escalated to a crime involving gun running and even according to McGowan an underworld threat of retaliation. He was absolutely certain that Susan White presented uh, a danger, an actual danger to the informant that had been used to buy what he said was an Uzi submachine gun. Officer McGowan had waited a long time for this moment. Taking down the head of a gun running ring which was flooding Houston with Uzi submachine guns. And who might be the leader of the gang? Someone superficially living the life of a homemaker in leafy old oaks, Susan White. A sale of one single handgun suddenly becomes a big gun running, organized crime, mafia type scenario where the Don of the Mafia is a middle-aged housewife. Officer Kent McGowan was en route to the office of District Attorney Jim Mount. He wanted an arrest warrant for Susan White, who he said had threatened the life of her son's friend, Michael Schaefer, a snitch who'd caused son Jason to be picked up by police. Informants in Houston, she told Michael's mother, don't live long. The initial district attorneys are going to say, yes, we will help you write this affidavit because this person is so dangerous. We cannot have people retaliating against our witnesses. We're not going to allow that to happen in Harris County. He told me that Susan White uh, was a person who was going to support her son and knew what he was doing. And so uh, I guess in his mind, she was also part of this sale of this machine gun. Um, he, he never told me in great detail about why he thought she was such a bad person. It, it was sort of conclusory. She's a bad person. You know, she's somebody that we got to get. McGowan, a neighborhood patrol officer, wanted to be in at the arrest of the possible gun runner, Susan White a woman masquerading as Miss Middle America. So I went in after midnight, I'm talking about the, everything done. I went in, it was after midnight, I spoke to Jim Mount, and he said, yeah, and we, by the time I got the paperwork and all that done, it was I know, like 3.30 or 4 o'clock. He was adamant that he wanted to arrest her himself. Uh, again, that's not unusual, uh, so it did, that in and of itself didn't make me think something was wrong because not only now does he have Jason, the gun runner, now he's gonna go after the big boss. The leader of this big gun running cartel that operates in an affluent neighborhood. And I just told him, look, you, you can't get it done tonight. You can't get it done tonight. You're gonna have to get it done later. And, and he seemed to be chafed about that. He was a little upset about that. And he said he was gonna call his sergeant and then figure something out. But he was very, very clear that he was going to be the one to arrest her. This is the arrest warrant Officer McGowan needed. He arranges for two deputy sheriffs to accompany him to Amber Forest Drive, Old Oaks, home of Susan White and her son Jason, who was fast asleep upstairs. It's after midnight, August 25th. On arrival, he calls her to ask Susan to surrender. She makes no reply to him. She's already on the phone. She's called 911 to complain about people outside her door. 911 County, what's your emergency? Well, 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 Officer McGowan didn't know she was making the call. And so I'm out there on the scene. We're knocking on the door for 15 minutes out there. Who's there? He, accompanied by two colleagues, prepares for so-called dynamic entry, breaking down the door. I've always done dynamic entry, run a warrant to keep this from happening, keep somebody from flushing their drugs, you know, grabbing a gun, hiding or whatever. But I figured being this wealthy lady and wealthy neighbor, I didn't know, I didn't know she was a nut. At police headquarters, the 911 call continues. 
Susan White has been transferred. We have the transcript to clearly understand what Susan White said that night. She sounds confused. She was in a deep sleep when she heard men outside. The door gets kicked in. What are they doing? She's on the phone. She hangs up the phone. McGowan and two other officers rush in. McGowan later says he sees Susan White with a gun. I saw her go from right to left. So we had our weapons on, I look, and she's in the corner, she's holding the gun. And he opens the bedroom door to be confronted by this woman who's holding a gun and pointing right at him. Well, I came in, she had the, uh, the gun at waist level. And she never said a word, never, didn't say, she said nothing. She had the gun at waist level, and it's true, you do, I, mean, I was tunnel vision, I see the gun pointing right at me. This woman, Susan White, who he believes is the ringleader of a gun cartel, and she's pointing a gun straight at him. She was standing like this in the corner, in the, the bedroom, like the door was right here, and the door opened like this, and there was a, on the chest of drawers, the TV and a converter box on it, if I recall. And Show then me I, what she looked like. Huh? Show me what she looked like. She was standing with a gun just like this. He fears his life is in danger and that his deputy's life is in danger. Well, I saw her for maybe three seconds. I'm hollering at her three times, drop the gun, drop the gun. She doesn't. She continues to point it at him. I told her the second time, she kind of she kind of turned and pointed it right at me with the proverbial Mexican standoff. I'm about 11 feet away, I think it was. You know, and I told her a third time. When she does that, she had like this, she just squared at me. And she pulls a gun like this. And then that's, and then put her finger on the trigger. That's what I told her a third time. So he fires. Believing his own life and that of his two deputies is in danger, Officer Kent McGowan fires three times at Susan White. First round struck her in the chest. And she started going like this. The second round was behind it and, hit, and went through the arm and stuck right in the chest. Another bullet hit her in the head. She was dead. Brian Harris has heard the recording of the incident picked up via the 911 call made by Susan White. What you hear on the tape, you hear the entry being made. How many is there? I don't know. They're three. What are they doing? They're just okay. He uses an old method of assessing how long it took to travel from banging down the door to the bedroom of Susan White. Six seconds. Oh, they're three. 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, 1005, 1006. Susan is dead. She's been shot. By who? Deputy McGowan. Now, Susan had six seconds to live from the point that the door got kicked in to the time that Deputy McGowan sees her in her bedroom. He's a hero. He's cracked a big case. It's been his ambition for years to do this. He's been telling people, one day I'm gonna, I'm gonna break a really big case, and here he is. He's shot the leader of a gun cartel. She's dead. I did what I had to do to save my life, the life of Deputy Morong and Malloy at that moment. That's what I did. As far as Kent McGowan's concerned, he's done his job. He's a hero, case closed. But McGowan had not told the whole truth. What was the killer's mistake yet to be uncovered? Today, the murder rate in Houston stands at around 250 a year. In the early 90s, it was nearly double that. A north side, south side gangland feud accounted for many of that number. The death of Susan White, now a suspect in gun running who had allegedly aimed a pistol at an officer, was not immediately big news. Officer Kent McGowan had done what he had to do, no more. Deputy McGowan, right after the shooting, is freely talking to other people about what he had to do, what he felt he had to do. He's creating this hero cop, how he saved his fellow deputies, how he saved his life, that it was this profile and courage of how he behaved 
quote, under fire or potential of fire. He goes back to the police office. He's very proud of what he's done. He's boasting about it even. Officer McGowan's conscience was clear. Susan White had threatened to have one of his informants killed, an informant who had revealed that Susan's son Jason had sold him a gun, and according to Kent McGowan, Jason Aguilar had also revealed he could get an Uzi submachine gun for $3,000. Yeah, that's what they were telling me, yes. I didn't know Susan White, so I didn't know if she's a nut or not. I'm going by what my informant said. I couldn't question him on a serious situation like that. I talked to Michael, uh, Michael Schaefer a number of times that night, excuse me, <clears throat> and his mother, Jeannie Jakes. And they told me, yeah, that she's a nut. He was, that kid was terrified. He was calling me 911, 911 the whole time. But reading the statements given by colleagues, it's clear that the story does not add up. And Kent McGowan's post-shooting attitude was a concern too. At first, his colleagues are like, yeah, you've done a good thing, but they're like, you've just killed someone and it's a woman. That's not a normal reaction to, to killing someone, even if they were the ringleader of a gun cartel. That's a big red flag. As a homicide detective, and I've investigated numerous officer-involved shootings, uh, from officers being killed to officers being involved in shootings, I have never, ever in 21 years had an officer that actually bragged about what they did. I have always seen officers that are fairly quiet. We make sure they get some counseling, some psychological counseling. It's a traumatic event. It's not natural for a human being to take another human being's life. Kent McGowan, his actions after the shooting, the things he said, huge red flag. What's wrong with this guy? Some colleague officers reported another troubling detail of McGowan's post-incident behavior. He had asked for the casings of the bullets that he'd fired when the autopsy was complete. And then what he requests of the detectives, the trophy, he actually asks for the shell casings from his shooting scene so he can use them on display. Who would do such a thing? It's twisted. It's scary to think that you have a law enforcement officer that would be out on the street that would want to, almost as if it's a World War II ace where they put markings for every person they shot down. It's very disturbing as a fellow law enforcement officer that Kent McGowan would actually look at this as a trophy, the killing of a human being as a trophy. Most murders involve killers who know their victims. More often than not, they're over relationship issues or money. As detectives evaluate evidence, they speak of breakthrough moments, the realization from one fact which emerges that a killer has made a mistake. From the moment that the Kent McGowan began to brag about his exemplary behavior in protecting his fellow officers from the dangerous Susan White, his version of events began to unravel. Susan White was on nobody's radar as a gun runner. Apparently there's this big gun cartel in this affluent suburb of Houston. It's a woman. Um, she seems like a regular mum. Being that this neighborhood had little to no crime, most people would think is a great thing. But if you have a young officer that is trying to be this superhero, in their own mind, they can create a fantasy that's just not there. The kid at the corner street smoking a joint that's a huge major drug trafficker attached to a cartel. Somebody is speeding. That's a possible stolen car for them. So they take what some would consider minor or nonviolent offenses and they really blow it up. Now, if you take Kent McGowan's situation, you're talking about a sale of a gun, a handgun. And a sale of one single handgun suddenly becomes a big gun running organized crime, mafia-type scenario. And then the reason McGowan had given for needing an arrest warrant began to crumble. Michael Schaefer's mother, Jeannie Jakes, 165 miles away in Austin, Texas, did confirm that the couple had spoken in general about the trouble that their sons had caused and that Michael might be better served not becoming a police informant. But this was not a heated conversation between adversaries. Jason's mom calls Michael's mom 
No different than two kids who get in a fight in a schoolyard and parents are going to talk to each other. I take it as a, as a conversation in generalities, not a specific threat. So you have two grown women talking to each other and, and Jason's mom reaches out and says, you know what? What, is Michael crazy getting mixed up with this guy? I mean, you know, in the real world, people can get hurt. People have even died from doing stuff like that. If, if Deputy McGowan had simply told me that Susan White made a phone call to someone in another city and said, informants in Houston don't live long, that by itself would have been completely insufficient for me to draft a warrant for him. No judge would have signed it. No prosecutor would have accepted a charge against her. As for the suggestion that Uzi's submachine guns were part of that night's story, it simply wasn't true. As Kent McGowan gave evidence to investigators replaying events for them to assess what had happened, something else emerged. McGowan knew Susan White before that night's events, and she knew him well enough to be frightened that he was outside the door. A transcript was prepared of what Susan White had said, and soon it was confirmed she and McGowan had history. Susan White says she first encountered Kent McGowan because he kept pulling her over for speeding tickets. She says what he was really doing was hitting on her. Perhaps McGowan felt that sort of behavior was a perk of wearing the uniform. Kent McGowan is somebody that isn't gonna sit real well with the term no. And so when he's out in that neighborhood, he's wearing that uniform. And there's a couple of things you need to remind yourself when you're a young cop. Are you really that good looking? Suddenly you're wearing that uniform, you have all kinds of ladies and people hitting on you. Go back in plain clothes, you're really probably not that good looking. And are you really that smart? People twice your age now are asking you advice. You haven't been on earth that long to be that wise, but that uniform brings a lot of that. But that also sometimes can give a false sense of confidence. And I believe Kent fell into that category. And he had this single, beautiful, good-looking lady. Certainly why would she spurn his advances? When she says no, that's maybe perhaps her way of flirting with him. So because Kent McGowan couldn't accept the word no, or didn't have enough common sense to see that she wasn't interested, he kept pursuing her and pursuing her. He pursued her often enough for her to mention her concerns to one of his senior officers and to urge the operator at the end of her 911 call that night to send help. Who's there? Okay, do you need a deputy out to your house? They are trying to break into my house, please! and she's scared. She believes this guy's gonna kill her. He has made unlawful entry into her home. What are they doing? They're just broke in, okay. All she knows in her head is Kent McGowan, and he's here to kill me. Just days after the shooting of Susan White in an apparent justifiable act of self-defense, Kent McGowan had become a murder suspect. There were anomalies in his story. He had claimed the involvement of an Uzi submachine gun in his inquiries. Not true. To get an arrest warrant, he had claimed Susan White had suggested his informant might get killed. That claim appeared fanciful at best. And a big mistake made in his version of events he had not told the district attorney that Susan White knew McGowan and had complained about him harassing her. McGowan denies that he knew Susan White, though he accepts she may have known him. Well, you know what, maybe she was stalking me, I've been asked that. What was true? Was Officer Joseph Kent McGowan a hero cop or a killer in a uniform? And if so, what was the mistake that would uncover him?
Who was Kent McGowan? Investigators wanted to know more about their 27-year-old colleague. Kent McGowan, I would describe as a gypsy cop, somebody who was a narcissist, uh, somebody who truly believes that they themselves are that superhero. McGowan kept losing his jobs. The records uncovered show a checkered career rap sheet. He gets a job as a police officer. Things don't go well in the police force. He's accused of sexual harassment. People say he has violent tendencies. He's a shirker. He, he's quite lazy, actually, even though he says he wants, to, he wants to be a hero. He's heard making comments about women, disparaging comments about women. He loses his job as a police officer. He then volunteers to be a police officer. He loses that volunteer position. He volunteers again. He's desperate to keep on wearing that uniform and to keep having the power that that uniform provides. Kent McGowan has always refuted the claims made about him by officers who uncovered his career records. This is what he told us about the times he got fired, like when a complaint was made about him by a female officer. See, that's not true. That's what happened. Do you want me to go ahead and explain? or when he was let go as a police volunteer after complaints from the public. See, that's not true either. So then you went to Precinct 4. Right. And you were fired there after two months. See, after that's not true either. See, that's not true either. So you're saying the investigations against you at Houston Police Department, not true? No, there was, there was some minor investigations. That was it. And when, it was, I think, three of them. As for the sexual harassment claims, it was not just Susan White who'd leveled complaints against him. It was a former colleague, too. But McGowan maintains he was the victim. It was some female officer who was stalking me back then, and she was crazy. I told her she needs to back off, and you know, I talked to her after work. There are already questions about his attitudes towards women. He's previously been accused of sexual harassment, and here he is shooting dead a woman who he has a history with. Who detectives believed was clear they took McGowan's plausibility and charm as a cover-up for the truth. Some of the most violent killers I dealt with in 21 years of investigating homicides were charming, were so likable in that interview room. Uh, you wanted to like them, but I wasn't a fool. I knew that in a second they would kill me without even thinking twice. So Kent McGowan he was charming, he was likable, he was obsessed with being popular, he was obsessed with being that super cop, and that's what made him so dangerous. He would do anything to portray himself as that superhero. Character evaluations are one thing. If a jury was to convict Kent McGowan as a killer rather than believe he's a cop acting in self-defense, detectives needed more. They began to forensically analyze McGowan's portrayal of what went on during the six seconds from when he entered 3407 Amber Forest Drive and when he shot Susan White. Well, I came in, she had the, uh, the gun at waist level and she never said a word, never. Didn't say, she said nothing. She had the gun at waist level and it's true, you did, I, mean, I was tunnel vision, I see the gun pointing right at me. McGowan said in evidence that Susan White was standing by her bed facing him, square on, and holding a gun in her right hand. So I said, drop the gun, drop the gun. She was facing you, square on. Yeah, well, at first she was, yeah, she was like this. She had it like this, pointed right at me. I said, I said, I said drop the gun, drop the gun. And when I said the second time, she comes up and she points the gun, worked the proverbial Mexican standoff, and I saw the, she had the weapon in next, her finger was not on the trigger. Her finger was not on the trigger at that point. And that's what I was watching. The trigger, I knew if she, put the, if she touched the trigger, I'm going to have to shoot her. I told her, I said, I told her a third time. I see her put her finger on the trigger, and I hollered a third time, drop the gun. I see her squeezing the trigger, and I fired three rounds, and she falls. But anyway, she, um, uh, she falls face down, and then Morong went underneath me and jumped on top of her. Because we didn't know if she'd been hit or not. I mean, the room's full of smoke, the alarm's going off, and I'm going to the radio call for a supervisor and an ambulance. Well, first thing, we run up to her, and, uh, and she was on her right, on her left side, and the gun was still in her right hand. The gun was still in Susan's right hand. 
there's a big problem for Officer McGowan at this point in his evidence. Susan was a lefty. I venture to say that Kent McGowan didn't know that. But Susan White was left-handed. Why would she be holding her gun in her right hand? And if you're lefty, you're going to have, if you were to follow Deputy McGowan's story, you would have the gun in your primary hand. For the most part, you would have it in your left hand. When you look at the angle of the bullets, the wounds on her body, it doesn't match the scenario of somebody holding a gun in their right hand. So right there, when you do the physical autopsy on someone, that also is a roadmap of what happened. So an autopsy is done on Susan and the angle of the bullet, the location of the wounds, they do not match whatsoever the scenario of Susan holding a gun in her right hand. The angle of the bullet and the location of Susan White's injuries did not support McGowan's statements. If she was standing square onto McGowan, his shots should have entered her body in a direct straight trajectory. When she had the gun, when she was standing there, she, when I said, drop the gun, drop the gun. As I told her, she goes like this, and, and when she pulls it up, when she does that, she had it like this, she just squared at me. And she pulls the gun like this, and then, that's, and then put her finger on the trigger, and that's what I told her a third time. If you listen to Deputy McGowan, they have guns pointed at each other. It's a standoff. He had to fire before she fired first. And the guns were leveled right directly at each other. However, Susan's wounds on her body, the wounds going from right to left, that's an indication she's turning. Maybe hanging up the phone, turning, what? Or whatever's happening, but she's in a turning motion. And the way the angles of the, of the wounds are, the way the angle of the bullet to her head is that angle, that autopsy, that's a road map. When they do the bullet analysis, what they find is that the bullets, there's strong evidence the bullets entered the side of her face and the side of her body. That's completely at odds with what McGowan is saying. It is not consistent with the deputy's story that they were face to face, guns pointed directly at each other. You see, the wounds itself, that physical autopsy, totally disputes what Deputy McGowan states. District Attorney Jim Mount was part of the system that issued the arrest warrant, so allowing McGowan the chance to shoot dead Susan White. Now, what I believe happened is that I was giving him permission to go into her house and kill her. He is now certain that he would have found a way to kill her with or without the cover of a warrant. Nevertheless, that night would have been different if Officer McGowan had not had this crucial piece of paper. Clearly, he wanted to be able to arrest her, to go into her house, have a legal basis to go into her house. And, and that's what I provided him uh, and, and what a judge provided him. Uh, that's, you know, that's why I say if, if, if a guy like Kent McGowan wants to kill you, he's going to kill you. He just managed to do it under the color of law. He's identifying himself as police? Yes. Yeah. But that, they were, I was in my bedroom, my bedroom sleeping, and there was somebody, they were looking through my window. They, they said, this is the police. Who's breaking into your house? I don't know. They say they are detectives. I have been threatened by one of them. How um, many is there? I, I don't know. They please. What are they doing? They're just broken. Okay. Kent McGowan was his own worst enemy. Loose lips sink ships. He wanted to be that super cop, so he brags about what he does. He perhaps fabricates in his own mind, creating this huge scenario of what took place in the shooting and the gun running, how he got this really bad person, and he's this super cop. The fact that the trophy bullets raise suspicion raise suspicion more than what an autopsy would do. So now you have an autopsy where the initial investigators are at the scene. They're observing his behavior. They hear about some of the comments he makes. Bells and whistles start going off. Now they look at the autopsy. They are comparing the trajectory of the bullets on Susan's body to the statement that Kent McGowan makes. 
which causes them to go back and look at the affidavit. Wait a minute. This affidavit says a whole bunch of stuff, and the scene is not telling us that. This is just a homeowner, perhaps with a gun in their own house, like so many other Texans or Houstonians have. This is not some major gun runner. As a prosecutor, when you have police officers come into your office in the middle of the night and tell you, hey, I need you to write me an arrest warrant for someone, you have to believe what they tell you. You have to take it as the truth. Otherwise, the system grinds to a halt. So not knowing Deputy McGowan, I believed that he was going to tell me the truth, and I relied on what he told me. Turns out that it wasn't. McGowan was found guilty by a Texas jury. An appeal based on a technicality was granted, but he was found guilty again. But, you know, in retrospect, he got convicted twice. How can anyone think that he really is not guilty? I mean, seriously. So what was the key turning point that led to the charges of murder leveled against Kent McGowan? What was the killer's mistake? For Brian Harris, it was not a what, but a who. Kent McGowan himself. Kent McGowan's biggest mistake was thinking that he had the character and the ability to wear the badge on his chest. That man never should have been a law enforcement officer. With 2020 hindsight, it's pretty clear to me that this is a guy who probably should never have been a police officer, should never have been in a position to run an arrest warrant on someone who he apparently had a personal grudge against. When you wear that badge, you represent, that's why it's called a shield. It's a shield to protect others. It's a shield of honor. It's a shield of integrity. It's a shield of service. You take an oath to lay your life down for others, to serve other people. Kent McGowan's oath was to himself. He wore that badge to serve himself, to glorify himself. His biggest mistake was thinking he truly could be a police officer. He was a crook with a badge, is how I look at it. Kent McGowan was not given a mandatory life sentence. He is due for release in 2022. He still maintains his version of events that night is true. I've got to, I've got to go. I know you got to go, and I appreciate it. OK, thank you. Hey, I'm innocent. Get, get, Dollar wants the truth. I'm not, the I'm truth. not done. I'm still working. Uh, I'm trusting you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Hey, how do you... We'll get this to the, the mic. Right, back here. <clears throat> Willie Inman is a 21-year-old who liked to practice shooting on his down-at-heel family ranch deep in the Arizona countryside. Recently claiming to be back from serving as a soldier in Iraq, he was on edge when police called by. They start pounding on the door, and with me being so jumpy from the service, they're lucky I didn't come to the door with my gun. You like guns? Yes, I do. What, what kind do you have? I've got a Walter P-22, I got a M-14, I've got three shotguns. Willie's friend, Ricky Flores, 16, missing from home. He'd gone AWOL before, but had promised to mend his ways. It didn't make sense that he was gone and he wasn't coming home, so that was uh, the first clue that something wasn't right. A lot didn't add up for local detectives in this remote part of Apache County. We both had the same feeling that Ricky was hurt or that he was dead. I knew it wasn't good. He didn't hang out with the best crowd of people. Nick Flores' brother, Ricky, hung out with Willie Inman, the guy with a hurt trigger. One day, Inman walked into a police station and started talking. Did detectives have a killer in custody? And was he responsible for the murder of two other men? I didn't suspect any foul play or anything. There was a little bit of blood that was outside of his mouth and some uh, blood pooled up in his uh, left ear. 
We know that, you know, if you've done something bad, the worst thing in the world is for you to have to carry it the rest of your life. The rules of engagement were in place. Cop seeking the truth. Killer, a skilled liar. If I was to do such atrocity, I could be out there getting rid of it and you would never know. Detectives gather evidence until a picture of a suspect emerges. Which piece of the puzzle will reveal Willie Inman as guilty of murder? What would be the killer's mistake? Apache County, an area of ranches and small communities like St. John's, population 3,200. It's a small town. There's not a lot of people. Everybody knows everybody. It's a good place to live if you don't like a lot of company. But unfortunately, you know, bad things happen everywhere and just happened to be to my family here in St. John's, Arizona. Ricky Flores, Nick's brother, was murdered. His head was blown off with a 12-gauge shotgun. Ricky had last been seen alive with this man, Willie Inman. He lived on a ranch just outside St. John's. Willie's girlfriend, Stormy, lived in Springerville, 29 miles away, different police jurisdiction. Something which would loom large in the story of William Inman. Willie walked into Springerville Station on a hot August morning just five weeks after his buddy, Ricky, was first reported missing. When he got there, he insisted on seeing the chief of police himself, Steve West. I sat down with Mr. Inman, and we started talking, just general talk. Chief West knew nothing about the missing Ricky Flores. Why would he? Flores was a St. John's matter. This was Springerville. Like a lot of communities, we still have crime. We just don't have as much of it. Uh, you know, children still walk, you know, to the stores. They still uh, uh, go to the movie theater by themselves. Chief West was as in the dark as anyone about Ricky Flores as he sat opposite Willie Inman. During a nine-hour interview session which followed, there would be many revelations. As well as a love for guns, Willie Inman shared views with Nazis. He showed his fascination by donning Nazi insignias on his baseball cap. Wow. My grandpa was the greatest Luftwaffe off pilot any pilot ever existed. Only one to receive over 1,200 kills. Willie had a deep sense of what he believed was wrong, was right, was bad, or good. And he wanted to rid the world of what he saw as undesirables. I try to be as law-abiding as possible. The first time that I knew about the case was when we got a press release about the disappearance of Ricky Flores. Karen Warnock is the local reporter who covered the story of Ricky's disappearance. We've had other missing people in the area occasionally. Um, and at the time, it didn't really strike a chord. It was just another juvenile disappearance. My brother went missing in uh, August of 2009. No one really knew what was happening or what was going on. No one in my family knew. What was confusing to the Flores family about Ricky's disappearance was that he had turned over a new leaf. He'd been something of a wild child until recently. My brother just uh, got out of juvenile, and uh, instead of staying in there longer, he decided to take one year probation for some minor drug charges and stuff. And he was working on himself and his life. And he was starting to realize that he couldn't just keep falling off, and uh, he was really trying to work on himself, and he was a good person. St. John's detective Lucas Rodriguez knew all about Ricky and liked him, despite his adolescent ways. 
Ricky Flores. Good kid, a little bit rebellious. Um, he has been in trouble. Mostly, I would say a lot of it, mostly that juvenile, only juveniles can get in trouble with. Curfews, um, smoking, and maybe a little drinking. He has done some, a little bit of drugs. Um, lost some fighting with his mom. And by fighting, it don't mean punches. I mean verbally and not wanting to listen to mom and stuff like wanting to be his own, own man, stuff like that. And he decided that, you know, enough was enough and told my mom that he wanted counseling and he wanted to uh, just do some programs to help him through it. I mean, he's a young kid. He doesn't know what's going on and he's just trying to have fun. How would Officer Rodriguez sum up the character of Ricky Flores around that time? Ricky does have a good heart. He does care about his mom, does care about his brothers and family and stuff like that. He, he just likes to do his own thing and doesn't want to, people to tell him, but he is in the process of uh, changing his life, changing his, um, he just has a new kid. Uh, now he knows he has to be responsible and change his ways. It's not just about him anymore. What had changed Ricky for the better was fatherhood. He wanted to do good and he wanted to take care of his newborn baby. Ricky, Hispanic, had a white girlfriend called Jessica Johnson, now the mother of his child. They all knew Ricky was behaving himself, so why would he suddenly disappear? I was called by dispatch and asking me to meet uh, Maura Flores. Uh, she had reported him missing for, had been a week now and still had not heard back from anybody and still had not uh, known, heard from Ricky. Ricky, she said, never left without his phone charger and always checked in, even on bender days when he'd get high, but not this time. So it didn't make sense that he was gone and he wasn't coming home. So that was uh, the first clue that something wasn't right. Well, I knew it wasn't good. He didn't hang out with the best crowd of people. People like Willie Inman. William Inman was just uh, another person that hung around my house. He was friends with my brother. My mom fed him. She gave him food. She gave him clothes if he needed them. Willie referred to Mauda as mom. So, hey, mom, I'm taking uh, Ricky out to uh, the ranch. For, we're gonna shoot or something, go shooting or something like that. And Ricky said, hey, mom, I'll be back in a little while. Well, Ricky and said, yeah, no problem, son. And uh, saw them jump in the Jeep and take off. And she waved goodbye to Ricky with Inman by his side. They went to Willie's ranch, met up with his girlfriend, Stormy Williams. She said that was the last time she saw Ricky and heard from Ricky. Willie Inman picked up Ricky Flores and they were friends. And he took them out to his property out east of St. John's. Officer Rodriguez brought Willie into St. John's police station for questioning. Where is Ricky, he asked. Willie told me that indeed Ricky was at the ranch with him and that um, they had gone, talked about, he talked to, to him about drugs and to stay away from drugs and stuff like that. It was to be a recurring theme in the interrogation of Willie Inman. He was a good guy, helping out a teenage kid with good advice during target practice. Willie had no idea where Ricky was. But detectives didn't believe him. And Ricky's brother, Nick, was not hopeful either. He liked to party and he liked to get in trouble. He hung out with older people. So uh, I figured it wasn't anything too good why he was missing. Detectives in St. John's did not believe Willie Inman's story and suspected him in a murder of Ricky Flores. Now, could they get him to admit it? If there was an accident, Something went wrong. Self-defense, whatever the reason was, I'm gonna give you one chance, one time, sitting here in front of the chief, to tell me why it happened. Over the days and weeks following the disappearance of Ricky Flores, Officer Lucas Rodriguez was to meet with Willie Inman often. He'd ask the same question. I mean, Willie, come on, tell me where Ricky is. Uh, 
as the interview progressed, I can see a lot of deception signs on, on uh, Willie. His carotid artery, I've never seen, but his carotid artery was literally bouncing. Um, he started sweating, he started getting hot. He didn't fidgeting, he started, um, he actually took his shirt off saying it was too hot in there. I was in uniform and it was not hot. I had a vest on and I was comfortable. He, um, he was just, I just could not get him to tell me what had happened to Ricky. Um, I asked him, I remember asking him if, um, if I was gonna find Ricky alive. And Willie said, he hoped so. It was soon after one such interview that Inman left St. John's police station. He headed over to Springerville to meet up with his girlfriend, Stormy, 18 years older, with educational difficulties. Detective Rodriguez wasn't giving up easily and called on the couple there, along with a colleague, Deputy Morales. Still no answers. We thank Willie and Stormy for talking to us, told him we'll get back in touch with us because we were looking for Ricky. And they said, yeah, no problem. Uh, Deputy Morales and I left, and on our way back into town, me and him were talking. We both had the same feeling that Ricky was hurt or that he was dead. As for Willie, he'd grown tired of Lucas Rodriguez and the St. John's Police Department. He headed to the chief of police, Steve West, over at Springerville. Help me out, chief. Get these guys off my back. What St. John's PD is asking you is they're asking you if you know the whereabouts of Ricky. Correct. And what's Ricky's last name? Flores. Flores. Okay, so they're asking you if you know the whereabouts of Ricky Flores. Uh, they're saying what? That you were the last one to see him? Correct. Mm -hmm. And that um, I know something and they keep pressuring me like I do know something. Which if I didn't, I would tell them because I want them off my back. So I'm tired of being harassed. They have no right coming to my girl's house, no right whatsoever. And um, last time they came here, they came here without a sheriff escort. They came in their St. John's police car out of jurisdiction. Uh oh. Uh -huh. And they've broken the law. They searched her next door neighbor's house, and which this is Stormy's next door. Yeah, house? correct. Which they had no right being in his yard. Willie and Men had made a big mistake. He believed one of the police forces in Apache County would not support another in a missing person inquiry which was increasingly feeling like a murder investigation. Normally it's for a chief of police not to, to get involved in a case is kind of rare, but since he had already struck a rapport with Willie, we allowed continued, um, Steve to con continue talking to Willie. Still, no one knew where Ricky Flores was. But if he had been murdered by Inman, investigators needed to find a body, establish motive and method. That last part would prove straightforward. Inman was a trained gunman whose best friends were the guns that he fired out on his ranch. Were you ever, were you, when you were in the military, were you, were you ever dispatched overseas? Yes, sir. Oh, was that right? Where did you fight? Iraq. Oh, did you? Yes, sir. Where was the first place you were deployed over there? First place was Fallujah, uh -huh. and then from there we moved downwards, and then it was the uh, sniper alley I mainly was on, which was a six-mile stretch between the Green Zone and Baghdad Airport. Steve West was employing a softly, softly approach and was getting results. Inman had almost certainly revealed how he had killed Ricky Flores by shooting him. But if he had, what was his motive? It was really strange because Mr. Inman, he had uh, this affinity, number one, as far as being calm, to why he was there. He didn't seem upset about that at all. But the other thing was he had this uh, affinity to talk about Nazism. And the way he did that is he did the, the Nazism, and, and the way it came out was on his baseball cap, he had uh, some Nazi insignias, some little medals on there. Inman, who cherished his German heritage, claimed that his grandfather was a crack Luftwaffe pilot who'd fought a just war. The final solution, mm -hmm. and seriously, 
I totally understand going after the Jews for bankrupting our country and trying to steal the world and everything they do and believe in, and we needed our money back. And as Chief West sweet-talked Willie, Officer Rodriguez was listening to a different story. He'd asked Willie's girlfriend, Stormy, to call by Springerville Police Station. Her arrival was the turning point in the investigation. She'd been with Willie when he had returned to his ranch with Ricky. It was decided to tell uh, Stormy that Willie was, had confessed to the homicide. Stormy actually started talking and said yes, they had killed Ricky and went into detail on how they had killed him and how they had taken him back to town and how they had buried him. Until the moment that Inman entered Springerfield Station, he had revealed no mistakes in the murder of Ricky Flores. Now he was regretting ever asking Chief West for protection from those St. John's cops who'd stepped out of line. It had resulted in his girlfriend giving them both away. What had happened down on the ranch? Just tell us, tell us what happened, Willie. Really. That's the biggest thing. Run us, run us through it. Oh my God. Well, I mean, stuff happens. We know that. Yes. And I'm telling you, I did not want to kill the kid. It was not, it was not murder. I can tell you that much. Okay. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Just tell us. Well, that's okay. It. Yeah, just tell us the story. Inman claimed that he and Ricky had got into an argument whilst at target practice on Inman's ranch. But Ricky had fired first. This ended up as self-defense. Something happened. We finally got him to, to admit that he indeed did uh, uh, shoot this kid. Now, the way he said he shot him was this. He said they were both out at the site east of St. John's and that they were out there and they were target practicing. And they started uh, shooting cans and whatnot, and Ricky wanted to uh, shoot the rifle, and so he let him shoot the rifle, and Mr. Inman said that he was standing by his car, and a bullet hit the window next to him. He said that he took that as an aggressive move, and he got his rifle and started firing at Ricky. He shot at me, I shot back. Willie did disclose that the homicide had actually occurred at, at his ranch. I believe he shot him in the head. I had a single gauge shotgun, and he had my M14, and he took a shot at me, and I shot him. As the real life drama unfolded, it seemed the case was closed. Of course, by then he was in tears. You know, he, he, was, he was acting semi-remorseful. And the way that we got that interview out of him was basically saying, hey, you know, people do bad things, you know, please, you know, we know that, you know, if you've done something bad, the worst thing in the world is for you to have to carry it the rest of your life, you know, you need to come clean on that so that your conscience will be clear. And we went on and on and on, and finally that's when he admitted that. God, I can't believe this. I'm going to go away from murder. I'm just Willie, you need to settle down. We need to get all the facts so that we can determine what's happened here. Okay? We need you to stay together for us. We're not your enemies. Please, I need some tobacco, please. My God, I can't believe this. At first, Willie stuck to his self-defense story. But was he telling the truth? Was this really a case of self-defense? Ricky's girlfriend, Jessica Johnson, had a father who did not like Hispanic boys, like Ricky Flores. I believe at one point, uh, Mr. Johnson and Melissa Johnson, the mom of Jessica Johnson, got a restraining order against Ricky and not allowed him to come around and be around Jessica. Well, it didn't matter because Jessica loved Ricky and she would sneak out of the house as well and go meet with him and vice versa. And. Jessica had just recently given birth to a child, which is belonged to Ricky. It was even rumored that Jeff Johnson, Jessica's dad, was connected to a white supremacist group, one that Willie was all too afraid of. They're all dead either way. As he goes down, there's too many out there. They are too smart. They will find me. They will kill me. 
What other damaging evidence which might implicate others would emerge from the interview room? Was Williamman a hired gun working for a racist? Throughout Texas and Arizona, a neo-Nazi group called the Aryan Brotherhood has been carrying out drugs and gun-running crimes for decades. Exclusively white, its so-called captains exert a violent influence over its members. Fraternization with non-whites is forbidden. Detectives throughout the Apache County area suspected Jeffrey Johnson, father of Ricky Flores's girlfriend, of involvement with the Brotherhood. Police now had a theory which would blow Inman's self-defense claims out of the water. It would not look good to Mr. Johnson that since he's a white supremacist, that uh, his daughter had a kid from a Hispanic kid and did not want, he wanted, basically he wanted uh, Ricky gone and had offered to pay money for that. Had Jeffrey Johnson ordered a hit on the boyfriend of his daughter? Another detective entered the room. I understand the white supremacist swastikas. I know every tattoo on the guy's body. I know all about this guy right now. I've known about him for a long time. Quit taking care of him and take care of yourself. He knew you were going to murder him, and he was supposed to pay you. I know that. Tell me the truth, please. Willie was not about to give evidence against Jeff Johnson in a murder crime. Listen, he wanted me to beat his ass, yes. He didn't want no death, no killing. And I thought about it, but it's no. These were the facts established. After the murder of Ricky, Inman and Stormy Williams drove at speed from his ranch into St. John's and headed straight for Jeffrey Johnson's house. He drove his body through the town of St. John's to Jeffrey Johnson's house. The whole reason for Willie bringing the body over into town in the beginning of just, instead of just going through the back roads and going away from town, was that he came over and showed proof to Mr. Johnson that he had actually taken care of the job and killed uh, Ricky. My niece was probably sitting there, you know, just a couple months old, and you know, her dad's body is in the back of a Suzuki Samurai, and uh, her biological grandfather is going out there to look at it. Why did you take the body to Jeff's house? Because I was scared. I wanted to know. I, Tell me exactly what you told Jeff when you got to his house. I told Jeff, dude, I, he's in my car. You, you want to come look? Dude, I need some help. What the hell am I going to do? His words were exactly, get the f out of here and I don't want to see you again. That was his words. William said that Mr. Johnson gave him a bunch of got mad at him for bringing the body, and that um, got $20 from him for gas, and that was all, and he took off. Had Jeffrey Johnson made a flippant, angry comment about wishing Ricky dead, and Willie taken it at face value? Inman left, drove up to the Elk Ranch, found a deserted spot, dug a shallow grave, and set Ricky's body alight. Storm E. Williams told detectives enough for them to find it. Well, uh, his body was burned so bad and his head was blown off with a 12-gauge shotgun, so there wasn't too much to be looking at. So they had to identify him by a homemade tattoo he had on his ankle, and he also had broken his arm pretty severely and got some pins and plates in it. So that's how they identified his body, because there wasn't too much to, uh, to say that this person was who he was. Inman repeatedly refused to say that the murder was anything to do with Jeff Johnson. Why are you so afraid of Jeff? What do you know about him that scares you so bad, Lily? I know the Aryan Brotherhood. There's too many out there. He gets one message through to anybody. I will be dead. That's guaranteed. I know how they roll. He goes down, I will go down. 
So you're covering, you don't have to admit to it, but you are covering his ass because you're afraid of death. Tell me that, much. I'm afraid of death, period. Willie did not testify in court that he had acted on the instructions of anyone. Jeff Johnson and his wife, Melissa, would stand trial for hindering the prosecution in the case of the murder of Ricky Flores. I think his charges were correct because he had knowledge and he, he did nothing to try to slow that down. But also, I think that by sure virtue of it taking place, I think that was a shock to him also. Jeff Johnson was sentenced to seven years in prison. Melissa Johnson was given probation. As for Willie's girlfriend, Storm E. Williams, she had been with Willie when he killed Ricky, had helped him move the body. But the mental well-being issues that she faced meant that she would never be charged. Wasn't a person who could think on her own. That she, uh, she would make a decision to do something, and uh, if she felt like it you know, made Willie happy or you know, Willie wanted her to do it, she'd do it. You know, she, she wasn't a crazy person. She was just uh, really gullible and would do anything to, you know, make William Inman happy. So that appeared to be the full story of what had happened out on Inman's Ranch and later in St. John's and Elk Ranch. A teenager shot, his body paraded in front of his child's grandfather before being burned and partially buried. Willie even drew for detectives where the partial burial took place. But that was far from the end of the William Inman murder story. Detectives were still unable to find the gun that he had used to kill Ricky. He asked him about the gun, you know, what happened to it. He had indicated that he had thrown it in the sewer pond over in, in uh, St. John's. Not having the murder weapon felt like a loose end. Perhaps it had been used in other crimes. In St. John's County, there had been a suspicious death two years earlier, and another person had gone missing that same year. The suspicious death was of William McGarriger, known as Stoney, a 72-year-old who'd been found dead in his trailer in 2007. Did Inman know anything? There's another case I want to talk to you about. The clock is running. If you can help us on that murder, I had no idea on that at all. I do not. He and me, Stoney was murdered, and that was quite some time ago. How'd you hear about it? First, I was uh, laying down, and I got a phone call. And um, the, uh, my dad told me. That's how I first found out. Six hours after Willie Inman had asked Chief West for help, he had confessed to killing Ricky Flores. Now he was a suspect in another murder. But how would detectives get the evidence for that crime if indeed he was guilty? God, I can't believe this. I'm going to go away from murder. I need to fucking kill him. What else had happened in the William Inman story? Stoney McGarriger was a loner who lived out in the woods near St. John's. His ranch was right next door to Ricky's. Real estate salesman Louis Lerer helped buy the property for him. Stoney, um, I met him when he first came up to St. John's. He was a character, and he didn't trust a whole lot of people. And if you bet betrayed his trust, then, oh, all hell broke loose. And, uh, and he, he, if you made him mad, he'd get in your face, he'd go nose to nose with you, and he'd scream at you, and, and make, oh gosh, he was dramatic. But, he was a character, and he was a caring kind, caring type of character once you were in his inner circle. Unpopular with many, Stoney McGarriger had faced some difficult times. He'd lost his wife and a young son in a tragic accident. As a result, he was depressed and an alcoholic by 2007. He mentioned suicide to his friend Louis on numerous occasions, said he was drinking himself to death. He would not touch a $50 bill, because when he lost his wife and his two sons, Many years earlier, he had been hoarding money, and all he had was $50 bills. And so that freaked him out. To, he wouldn't accept it for payment. He wouldn't carry it. Stoney, mistrusting of the bank, hoarded money in his home. People, including William Inman, knew all about that. One day in 2007, Louis LaRue was to be plunged into a drama all of his own. 
I had been out of town uh, during that day. I'd been up in Pine Top, and uh, a couple of people had contacted me and said, hey, we've been needing to get a hold of Stoney. He's not responding. He's not getting back with us. Um, we're concerned about him. Louis headed out to the ranch. So I went in there, and I, I found him. He was laying on his right side like he always slept with his arm up above the, the blanket. And then um, when I got over to him, he was, he was kind of gray color and cold and stiff. I realized he was dead. Um, not expecting anybody to be murdered. Nobody had been murdered in St. John's in decades and decades. The real estate salesman was in for a shock. Stoney McGarriger was shot in his bed while he was sleeping. He had been murdered uh, and been shot, and the homicide had gone unsolved since 2007. Detectives knew Inman was a neighbor of McGarriger. When still talking after the Flores revelations, one officer threw out a question. Back to the Stony deal. No, you don't know anything about that? No, sir. Help yourself out. No, sir. I no knowledge of that murder at all. A reward had been offered for information about the death of Stoney. Willie knew all about it. He would certainly have cooperated if he could. By that, I'd be collecting money. So me and my brother did. And what'd you say, you and your brother? Me and my brother were trying to uh, figure out who did because we wanted the money because we were hurting bad at that time. Right. With a population of just 3,200, St. John's had two murders on its hands, and only one solved. St. John's, you never expected anything like that. It's just a, a nice little community. When the, 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 the phrase is uh, St. John's uh, is a town of friendly neighbors, and that's pretty well what it is. Um, to have something like that happen is shocking. Investigators had come up with nothing over the two years since the murder of Stoney McGarriger, but for now, they asked no more of Willie Inman. Soon, at a case review, Willie Inman's name came up in relation to an old motoring offence, and another mystery was born. Willie had been stopped in a Camaro, a really nice Camaro. No plates, and the car had been impounded, and... But the car was... I believe the car was still an impounded. Nobody had taken it out. That had been months prior to this prior to Ricky being missing. And we started coming to a conclusion as to, okay, where's the owner for stuff like that. One officer remembered the vehicle, gave a report. I used to see this guy, and I think his name is Daniel. I used to drive it all the time, and I haven't seen him in a while. Daniel Acton, a Vietnam War veteran and another whose ranch was adjacent to Willie Inman's. I knew that he had not been around, and um, People were asking about him and things. I hadn't seen him, but, uh, but Daniel was a, a real nice guy. Who nobody had seen for a while. Police wanted answers to the mysteries out in Apache County. Well, we need to still get stony, and we still have, you still guys have a missing person that the car is still an impound, and that needs to be, be um, solved. And um, we, need, we need to find out where the person is that that they were driving the car. I told him, well, that's where you gotta go, and that's kind of where, where, where this needs to be. Two dead men, one confession, and a missing man. And they all had one thing in common. They lived on or next to the ranch of William Nicholas Inman. They'd got a confession once. What would it take for detectives to get the truth out of Willie Inman a second time? And was there actually a link between the three deaths? I don't think it was connected. I don't think in the beginning the disappearance of Ricky and the disappearance of Daniel or the death of Stoney, the murder of Stoney, was related. And if Willie Inman was in custody not suspected of the murder of Stoney, that left just one conclusion. We have a killer loose in the community. Was Daniel Acton a victim of murder? He was missing and his car was in a police pound having last been driven by William Inman. Acton was not the grumpy old guy that the murdered Stoney McGarriger was. Unlike him, Acton had no enemies. I knew Daniel um, as, as best as anybody did. Um, Daniel was, uh, I'm hard of hearing. Daniel was totally deaf. Once in a while he'd hear a word, but he read lips. 
It wouldn't take long for Willie to confess now that he'd started. Throughout the interview with Chief Steve West, Willie seemed eager to please. He was a good guy. He'd wanted to help Ricky. The kid just wouldn't listen. That was Willie's story. Corporal Inman was a former army man. He could be trusted. He did give up his rights to an attorney in order for us to talk to him the second time. And it was, it was almost like something you'd see in prison in the fact that he was willing to give up information for stuff on the second interview. If we got him cigarettes, he would talk to us. If we got him a hamburger, he would talk to us. So during that discussion, it was like, well, yeah, you know, lunchtime's coming up, we'll get you a hamburger, we'll, we'll talk to you about it, you know, yada, 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 and he did. Willie had admitted that he had murdered Ricky Flores. He'd had good reason. The kid was fooling around with drugs. During the second interrogation, Inman decided to trade. He'd agreed to the interview in exchange for a hamburger. Now he was going to up the stakes. He traded the truth for his life. If the police did not seek the death penalty, he would tell all. A deal was struck. Willie would not face execution in exchange for a full confession. He admitted finally that he had killed Stoney McGarrigar. After shooting Stoney 12 times through his window, Willie ransacked the house, stole some of the money that McGarrigar kept hidden. But there was something else that Willie claimed. Stoney had inappropriately touched Inman once. He was probably a child molester. And he actually said that they deserved to die. And he took officers out into the deepest part of the Elk Ranch to show where he had buried the body of Danny Acton. His crime, the deaf man couldn't hear what Willie could each evening. Yeah, Daniel, the main reason that uh, he wanted to do something about that was because of his barking dog. Yeah, he couldn't get the barking dog shut up. Willie ended up taking us. I remember going with Willie. He agreed that I, it was okay for me to go and follow him as he took us to the ranch where he had killed Ricky. He took us to the place where, um, uh, where uh, Daniel Ekman had been killed, and then he took us to where Stoney had been killed and how he killed Stoney. Inman, the former military man, the gun nut, had been seeking police protection, but it ended up bringing a naive accomplice in front of persuasive police detectives and then admitted three murders, murders that he felt he was justified in committing. He wanted to rid the world of people who he felt shouldn't be in this world. So he had a, a grievance against those men, so he took it upon himself to be the one to get rid of them, to make the world better. Indeed, he styled himself as a vigilante. He was branded a serial killer, a vigilante killer, the youngest serial killer in the country. He did this with, with malice. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was doing. He knew how he was going to do it. He planned it, staged it, and, and, and completed it. So if that isn't vigilanteism, nothing is. And he's doing it for a cause that he think, thinks is right, you know, whether it was barking dogs, whether it was because they're a do dope slinger, or whether they were uh, uh, a child molester or whatever. He, he always had this reason in the back of his mind for doing that. Once he started talking, Willie Inman couldn't stop. He'd wanted to avoid detection as a killer, but made the mistake of surrendering himself in the belief that he was too clever to be caught out. Willie, when he talks to you, when you talk to him, he can be looking at you, but you can feel like he's looking into your soul, kind of like, kind of like a scary type of uh, demeanor that Willie has. He never showed remorse, never, I don't, I think he would just do it again. He was nonchalant about the whole thing and how he went around and, and almost with a smile on how he killed him and how he, what he did and how he covered his tracks and stuff like that. Just like in any other day, it's just like you tell me how your, your day was and how it was at work. There has been controversy about Inman's sentence. Some expected the death sentence, others life without parole. In the event, he was given 24 years for all three murders to be served without parole. He's suffering in prison, and he's living with what he did all the rest of his days that he's there. I think what's going to be the most interesting is what happens when he gets out. So what happens then?
And that would be the story to cover, to find out, one, has he changed? Is he the same man? Of course, he was a boy, he was 21, so is he different? Is he going to do the same thing? Is he going to come back up into this community and live? I think all of that would be very interesting. Stoney McGarriger and Daniel Acton did not deserve to be killed by William Inman, but at least they'd lived a full life. Ricky Flores was a minor, a child in the eyes of the law whose life was taken by a man who considered himself to have just cause. There's some messed up part in his head that, you know, said, if I can kill these people and, you know, people can't figure out about it, and I'm obviously doing something right. You know, I'm taking bad people off the street. That's what he claimed his thought process was. But really, you know, he was just a skinny, frail boy who lived out east of St. John's, Arizona, that everyone, you know, just knew as the skinny, poor boy, that uh, it's kind of hard to make your name for yourself when you start there. And uh, he just wanted to to show that he had some sort of power. You know, he wasn't worthless. You know, he, he could make these kind of bad things happen, you know. He thought that he would be remembered as, you know, a mastermind of some sort. But really, he was just some dumbass that, you know, wanted to take people's relatives away from them. William Nicholas Inman will be released from prison in 2035. Broad daylight in East Cleveland. An ordinary day until one moment, something out of the ordinary. What happens on October 20th, 2009 is about to change everything. This 911 dispatcher gets a call. The man, the caller is frantic. She fell out the window upstairs on the second floor. Okay. Are you she laid on the ground, by her neck. Are you? He's just watched this woman come flying out of a second story window. And he's he's saying, she's on the ground here. They're saying, is she alive? Is she breathing? She's with her right now? I'm right here, right now. She's laying on the ground, okay. by her neck. She just came flying out of this window. He doesn't know if she was thrown, if she jumped, if she fell. He just knows there's something wrong here. There's a man inside the house. His name, Anthony Sowell. You know, he told the police, well, we were just using drugs together and she accidentally fell out of the window. Sowell has already enticed 11 women to use drugs inside 12205 Imperial Avenue. He selected his victims from a group of people in a community that would be hesitant to step forward and be witnesses. I got mad and I was like, cussed them out and told them to get the out of the house. Detectives gather evidence until a picture of a suspect emerges. Which piece of the puzzle will reveal Anthony Sowell as guilty of murder? What would be the killer's mistake? There is a gap between buildings in East Cleveland where once stood number 12205 Imperial Avenue. As long as Anthony Sowell could hide what is inside 12205, he would remain a free man. Because inside, he's hiding grim secrets. In one room, the decomposing bodies of two women. In another, a further three. And outside in his yard, yet more. What is known about the man who had frightened a woman so much that she threw herself from the second story of 12205 Imperial rather than stay a second longer? A man who would spend hours being interrogated by police and who seemed at ease throughout as he proudly discussed his four grandchildren. Yeah, four? 
step four. We call you Papa or Grandpa. Oh. Yeah. And I. You love that, don't you? No. You do. It's okay, no. <laughs> but I. That's everybody calling me. Yeah, that's the love for them. So I think you got know that. You keep probably like be skinny and grinning, yeah. don't you? Don't you? You don't be grinning when they be coming up to you. Anthony Soel seemed happy in police company, happy in the company of everyone. Many times when somebody is arrested, you hear their neighbors say, they were so quiet. I never knew there was anything wrong. I didn't think that they were capable of such a crime. I can't believe that that is my neighbor that did that. And that's what makes them so effective, is that they can blend in. He really had this kind of outward appearance to the neighborhood where he would hold barbecues and chat with people. They didn't really suspect him of doing anything like this. He could snap. People had seen him lose his temper. So it's kind of these two personalities that, that people would describe seeing. Um, you know, he had uh, at least one or two girlfriends at the time that we were, we were able to hear from afterwards who, who talked about, you know, the long conversations they would have and how, you know, kind and introspective he could be. But then he could also be very violent uh, if someone disagreed with him or didn't, um, you know, didn't say the right things. But a killer, not Tony Sowell, the party guy. There is no sign, no neon sign on anybody that says I'm a serial killer. I kill for a living. There is no sign at the intersection that you often see people hold, the I will work for food. They're not holding signs that say, I will kill for pleasure. Anthony Sowell's killing story begins to be uncovered with a 911 call. She looks like she's around about 40. About 40, all right. Yeah. Is she kind of... She She can't get up, though. I she, but she is awake, right? Look, I ain't even trying to go near her. I give her my T-shirt to put on. Is she awake? She, she kind of went and going is in and out. breathing? Yeah. And which, which window did she fall out? The first or the second floor? I don't know. Was it's, it's, it less than six feet or more than six feet? The second floor, yeah. 12, 15 feet. All right. Feet. All right. There we go. And it happened just now, correct? Yeah. The call had been made in a neighborhood of East Cleveland where violence was not uncommon. In fact, a year ago, another woman had fled from 12 to 05. December 2008, a woman in the neighborhood named Gladys Wade frantically flags down a police car. She tells the officers that she was attacked. She's got scratches on her neck. She's got a deep gash in her right thumb. And she says what happened is Anthony Soul asked her if she wanted to go drink beers with him. And when she said no, he punched her in the face, knocked her out, and dragged her into his house where he proceeded to choke her and tried to rip off her clothes. She said he had just this evil look in his face. She said it was like the eyes of the devil were glowing. And she said she fought back and tried to, to scratch his eyeballs out. Police visit the owner of 12205 Imperial where the attack had taken place and hear a different story from Anthony Soel. Gladys had hit him, he said. The officers decide this is a domestic they don't want to get involved and they want to quickly get out of the house. It is littered with trash and smells very badly. They smell this horrible stench, but they see trash everywhere. It's just a pit. They wanted to get away from the neighborhood too. Mount Pleasant. The name Mount Pleasant at that time, it was almost cruelly ironic because the neighborhood by then had really hit the skids. There was a lot of poverty, one in five houses was up for foreclosure. There was a lot of crime. This was a rough neighborhood. A lot of the residents of the area had fallen victim to the crack epidemic of the time. And uh, a lot of those people were women. And so they would roam the streets, searching for their next hit. And that made them easy prey for ruthless predators like Anthony Soul. Not that he was considered a predator. As likable as he appeared to be to some, not many did actually know much about Anthony Sowell. You know, he wasn't a person that everybody immediately had a specific memory of, but he was kind of always in the background, um, maybe a little bit socially awkward. Sowell was an ex-serviceman. He'd been a model Marine. Maybe the stringent 
rules in the military were good for him for a while. I know that he was able to, you know, cope in the military, do his job. He listened, he followed orders, directions, never really got in a lot of trouble. He would later tell probing detectives of his pride at his record. How long were you in the service? Seven years. Seven years? He'd done a seven-year tour of duty, and from everything that we know, he did well. He was a good serviceman. You were enlisted. You like you've been in, in the Marine Corps? I was good at yeah. yeah. In 1989, four years after leaving the military, it all begins to go wrong. When he gets out, he starts having problems. He breaks up with his girlfriend. He stops going to work, and he loses his job. And then he turns to drinking pretty heavily. Um, he's pretty much drinking all day. Beer was his vice. Uh, and things are kind of falling apart for, for Anthony Soule. The drunk Soel would target vulnerable women and entice them back to his place. And then things would get ugly. It wasn't long that he was home before he was actually accused of, uh, of harming several women. And actually two in kind of close proximity, there was two women, both of whom were pregnant, but also, you know, either abusing drugs or hanging out with people who were drinking that um, Anthony Sowell was accused of raping. His accuser, a pregnant woman, claims that he wouldn't let her go after she agreed to spend time with him. A woman goes to police and she tells them that Anthony Soule attacked her inside his home, that he bound and gagged her and raped her. Soel avoids jail, but not for long. He was never prosecuted for that case because he was actually arrested for another case, another rape, um, within the same year. And he was prosecuted in that case. He ended up pleading guilty to attempted rape and was given a sentence of up to 15 years in prison. Soel refuses to plea deal to contest what had happened, and he declines the chance of early release by admitting his guilt. His parole is repeatedly denied. When he gets out, because he served his entire sentence, he's not on parole. So he's not under police supervision. As a, as a sex offender, he has to register, and police have to verify his address, but that's pretty much it. He's pretty much free and clear. In 2005, Anthony Soel is released. After a long prison stretch, during which time he'd been a model prisoner, he's back in 12205 Imperial Avenue, where police in the East Cleveland neighborhood are dealing with a drugs epidemic. Because of his offense, he's on the sex register and dutifully attends the sheriff's office every 90 days as ordered. He was not someone they considered a problem ex-con. He was Tone, the party guy from Imperial. Serial killers also tend to be very smart almost sociopathic some of them can be and your sociopaths can also be very charming and when somebody is charming people like them they have relationships they build families and friends and so therefore people aren't going to question them they would never imagine that anthony zoel or other serial killers out there could do the evil that they do By 2007, Tony Sowell was living alone at 12205 Imperial, his parents having passed away. Drugs had flooded the Mount Pleasant neighborhood. The city was kind of getting poorer. There was a, the crack epidemic was really starting to affect the streets. There was a lot of mothers and fathers starting to use those drugs. So Al set about preying on the women made vulnerable by their dependence on drugs. His own days were dominated by booze. He was really, really the kind of guy that was doing a lot of drinking. He'd go to the store in the morning and get a beer and just kind of continue that throughout the day. A pattern was set. The drunk Soel would home in on vulnerable women and entice them back to his place. 12205 Imperial Avenue became quite the party venue. He would say, hey, do you want to come in and have a drink? Um, and his house was a place where he would let people crash if they were using drugs and didn't want to go home. 
the house you could tell it, it was it was definitely used for for a place where people could just crash and could just party um you know, there was beer bottles and or beer cans all around the rundown quarter of east cleveland offered perfect conditions for the predator soel drug confused women a place of his own to take them and a meeting venue where he could also get beers there was a little corner store right there that was kind of the hub of activity on Imperial Avenue. They were really familiar with Anthony so well. He would come in and buy, you know, um, tall beers, King Cobra beers, which he would drink often. People would come over to the store when they would come to his house, buy beer, party, kind of back and forth. When partying with Sowell, the menu was easy to predict. He might help cook up some drugs, and he might follow it up with a six pack of beers. Then it would be time for sex, whether the women wanted it or not. Every female that you have brought to the house, have each and every one of them used drugs or using drugs like crack or whatever? Is that one of the reasons why they come to your house? So they so they can smoke from your from your okay from them. And you you telling me that you don't do that. I used to, but you don't do that sometimes. On May 17, 2007, Crystal Dozier was wandering the streets of Mount Pleasant. She spotted by Tony Sowell. She fitted a then all too familiar East Cleveland profile. Now I'm trying to get the type of women that come to your house. And this is the type of women that come to your house are, are one drug users. First, I mean, outright drug use, very sure. Crystal Dozier was the mother of seven children. Her own family remembers that Crystal, when she was a little girl, she was the responsible one. She's the one you could always count on. And she, she loved helping around the house and learning how to cook. And she really liked pretending she was a grown up. And she loved getting dressed up. But drugs changed everything. Did you like them though? Did you like him when you met him? Yes. Okay. So you weren't mad at him when you met him. You kind of liked him all, right? Yes, yes. And by the time she was in her early teens, her life was just basically spinning out of control. She never shook her drug habit. They were all had these vulnerabilities that, that Anthony so well appeared to, to hone in on. So I looked at her, and she looked so sad and pitiful like she just had a rough rough time. So I said, a beer? I said, how you doing a beer? I said, it's closed. Oh, they will open up or something like that. So I said, I tell you what, come on with me. You can get all the beers you want. So well invited her in to 12205. He has raped before, but he has never killed. Nothing would be heard about Crystal for two and a half years, her anguished family unable to find her. She had been raped, then strangled. The most personal way to kill somebody is to strangle them. And in Anthony's case, it was personal and close. And so he was able to watch and literally watch the breath of life come out of that person. Her killer buried Crystal by the backyard fence of 12205. She had become victim number one of Anthony Sowell. There was no reported sighting of Crystal before her murder. Possibly she had been whisked into 12205 in darkness. Possibly detectives were not getting all of the information they could from a community at times at odds with the police. He selected his victims from a group of people in a community that would be hesitant to step forward and be witnesses. Other drug addicted women were lured into 12205 around the same time. And those women had gone to Anthony Sowell's house maybe to use drugs or drink or just hang out with him and had, had never left the home. As for Sowell, he was not suspected of any involvement in the disappearance of Crystal Dozier. There's even a suggestion that he may have tried to mend his ways. He participated in Alcoholics Anonymous, so he was aware that he had an alcohol problem. AA did not work. There is no indication that Soel took a day off from his heavy drinking. And when he was drunk, he would want to have sex. He would head out looking for a sex worker. One like Tashana Culver, 
who went missing in June 2008, a young woman drifting in and out of family life. Tishana Culver had tried to get clean. It just never took. The pull of the drugs was just too strong. But she had once had hopes and dreams. She'd gotten a cosmetology license. She'd even trained to be a medical assistant. But drugs basically consumed her life. She was 33 years old. She had six children. Her family was slow to report her missing. She disappeared so often. She was dead within two hours of entering 12205. His killing method of choice were his bare hands. Soel had perfected strangling by now. They will learn, they'll do everything the same, but this time they'll bring a gun. So it also is a learned behavior. They learn from their mistakes. And so throughout the years, Anthony learned from his mistakes and kept on trying to protect his craft. Can you tell me exactly what I did you do? No, I didn't. That's why I can tell you I wasn't no weapon. Mm -hmm. He didn't start out killing. I would bet that he learned and progressed um, to that point. And as he was successful with his first rape, he would do the next one and the next one and try new things. And in this particular case, ultimately, as a serial killer, he got the thrill from watching his victims die. Well, they would like piss you off or something, maybe? Or what? What, 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 what do you think would cause you to choke him? I mean, just off the top of your head. Think about it. Punisher. My girl and now something. That's all I can say. Huh. You, that was punishing them because of I was the punish. I was the punish. I, I, I can't explain. As for the residents of Mount Pleasant, all they knew for sure was that something bad was coming from somewhere in the neighborhood. Before long, people in the area start complaining about this horrible smell in the neighborhood. It is just, just a, a rotten stench. Uh, at least one neighbor calls the city and says, you gotta do something about this. This is just horrendous. It smells like something died, something or someone, but it kind of gets waved off by the authorities. Right next to the house uh, where Anthony Sowell lived on Imperial Avenue was a place called Ray Sausage. And for years, when there had been uh, foul odors that the neighbors noticed, they would call the city or call the health department. When people would come out, they would always attribute the smells to, to Ray Sausage. And in fact, the people that own this very small family-owned sausage company uh, redid their entire sewer system thinking that somehow the smell was being attributed to them, their sausage making their dumpsters. You know, we only realized later that, that it was probably Anthony Sowell. And in fact, the owner said at one point that they believed that he may have dumped some bodies in their dumpsters. The upshot after the complaint was that an opportunity to stop a killer killing was ignored. The smell remains, uh, and it just hangs over this neighborhood, just this rotten stench. It, the house where Anthony Sowell is living is, is just filthy, full of garbage, and definitely there's this horrible smell coming from there, but nobody ever does anything. No mistake yet big enough for cops to stop Soel, who carries on picking up sex workers when drunk and attacking them. Not always successful in his attempts to kill them. There was a number of women who actually made it out of Anthony Sowell's house, and, and each of them also described either being choked or strangled by him quite, quite aggressively, uh, sometimes with like a cord or a strap, other times with his hands. I was the punch. I, I, I can't explain. Those who had escaped Sowell's punishment had not told police of their ordeal fearful that they may be arrested for drug use and prostitution themselves. One woman would not reveal what she had seen inside 12205 until Soel was safely locked up. She caught a glimpse of one of the decomposing bodies, which frightened her and just made her, you know, realize I have got to get out of here. So what went on behind the door of 12205 Imperial remained undetected, uninvestigated. Sowell's good fortune and the fact that he was yet to make the mistake of attracting the police to his door meant that he was still free.
Between 2007 and 2008, women continued to go missing from Mount Pleasant. You know, their loved ones that they did love would go missing, but they would always call after a day or two. They would always come back. They would never miss important events like birthdays or Christmas. And so when they went missing for a longer period of time and didn't show up, a lot of them contacted the police and said, you know, this is different. And we're basically told, you know, hey, they'll come back when they're done using drugs. After all, who cares about women who often go missing for a living? One minute on the streets, the next selling sex in a location nobody knows of. Sex workers make perfect targets for serial killers. So the police were dismissive of these women for the same reason that Anthony Sowell likely targeted them. Anthony picked his victims because they were vulnerable. All his targets were black, drug addicted, and desperate for cash. Choosing the same profile of victim is familiar territory for serial killers and rapists too, like Anthony Sowell. The very first time that they're successful, they will continue to do the crime the same way every single time. Rapists are no different. If they were successful with a brunette living in an apartment, all their victims will be brunettes living in an apartment. I think he probably knew that people weren't going to come, you know, beating down his door looking for these women. And so the killing went on. LaShonda Long's life had never been easy. LaShonda Long was the youngest of Anthony Soule's victims. She was only 25. LaShonda's mom had been a crack addict. Her dad had been an alcoholic. And LaShonda's life pretty much fell into that pattern. It was only a matter of time before Soel would find her. She was simply not able to defend herself, her life distorted by drugs and bad choices. LaShonda had her first child when she was just a child herself. She was 14 years old. At 17, she had three children, and she'd lost custody of all of them. He hated the fact that they used drugs and would even say things to them about it and know he wanted to help them, but then he would also do it himself. So uh, it, it was, he definitely had this, this strange relationship where he would meet women who had drug problems. He would kind of entice them into his home, you know, with the idea of drinking or using drugs. But then he would also try to be very caring. Well, let me get you some clothes. Let me, let me feed you. You look like you need to eat. I know what. One thing about, I think all of them made me mad is they, they had kids. And they was out of the street. Yeah. That's a big thing in my head. LaShonda's fate was to be a gruesome one. One family, I think it was LaShonda Long, the only thing they really recovered of her body was her head. It was in a bucket in the basement, which was very difficult for them. They didn't even have a body to bury. So Al would describe his victim as pitiful, but he himself took no pity on them. The next woman to be enticed inside Imperial 12205 was Tonya Carmichael. Tanya Carmichael vanished in November of 2008. She was 33 years old. She was a drug addict, but she hadn't always been. She was once the protective mother who would chase away the drug dealers from her doorstep because she didn't want them to influence her children. But eventually, she fell into drugs. Her life kind of intersected with Sowell's early on. They both grew up on Page Avenue. Um, you know, she, she knew him, you know, probably tangentially. The families kind of knew each other. The addiction had led her to crime, to prison, away from her children, and eventually into the hands of a serial killer. She went looking for a hit and a bed for the night and chose 12205. She was not long for this world after taking that decision. When she initially went missing, you know, her family went to police and they were asking for help to find her. And the police said, you know, well, we know she has a drug problem. She'll come home when she's done using drugs. When Tanya went missing, her family says they went to police right away. The police told them, just wait. And this family really, they put up flyers. They were really searching for her, especially um, her daughter, Danita Carmichael really cared for her mom deeply and, and was searching for her. And so this was really difficult for her. She would never see her mom alive again. One day, Soel would describe her fate and that of others. 
His favoured method of murder was to use an electric cord or any cable nearby before pinning his victims to the ground. He would act quickly, subduing in seconds, showing no mercy. In 2018, an investigation would begin about why detectives had failed to arrest Sowell before he was eventually hauled in for questioning. His killing was relentless. Next to enter the foul stench of his crack den was Michelle Mason. Michelle Mason was finally getting the life she'd always wanted. She had spent so many years in a haze of drugs. She was hooked on heroin and crack. But by 2001, she was really starting to get things turned around. And her family just remembers this. This was really the happiest time of her life. She was living on her own. She had friends, real friends. And she hadn't, she had kicked her drug habit. She was clean and sober. But one day in 2008, she seems to have come across Anthony Sowell. On an October morning in 2008, when Michelle left the house and said she'd be back, and she never came back, her family knew something was wrong. They filed a missing persons report. They put out flyers all over the neighborhood. 15 months after claiming his first victim, Anthony Sowell has killed again for the fifth time. On October uh, 29th, 2009, some Cleveland police officers, some detectives actually went to Anthony Sowell's home on Imperial Avenue and they were looking to arrest him. A woman had accused him of rape. When they went to the house, he was not there. So they went away, figuring the overwhelming smell, which they could not miss, was from Ray's sausage store next door. How many more women would Anthony Sowell attract to 12205? What mistakes would he make before police would finally arrest him? It was October 20th, 2009, when a man walking on Imperial saw a woman falling from an upstairs window of 12205. He didn't know her, but it was obvious something very bad had been going on. 12205 okay. Imperial. He'd got away with so many rapes and murders, so Al sets about trying to get away with this latest attack. A week later, she does talk. She goes to police and she tells them what happened. The Cleveland police who had known about complaints related to the man who lived inside 12205 knew about his past as a convicted rapist. They only now decided to go inside and take a good look around. October 29th, police go to Anthony Soule's home with a search warrant and an arrest warrant. Soule isn't there. They go inside. The place is just unbelievable. It's trash everywhere, clothes strewn around. It smells unbelievable. They entered the home and they found the bodies of two women who were basically sitting out in the open decomposing. They're just lying there, rotting, and they're next to a shovel. And the police don't know what they have on their hands here, but they know they need help. So they call in other officers to help. Once they found that, they called in a lot more police and some crime scene investigators. And over the course of maybe a week or more, they found um, many more bodies. There was no immediate sign of Anthony Sowell, but it wouldn't be long before he reappeared in the neighborhood. On October 31st, police find Anthony Sowell walking down the street about a mile from the house. They arrest him. They charge him with five counts of murder. But the bodies keep turning up. Detectives are staggered to learn that Sowell does not know how many bodies he had hidden around his property. All I say is on the TNS. That's all I So... Hold up. Understand. If you were in my shoes, what would you want me to tell you? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. They cordon off the house. They cordon off the yard. They find three more bodies in the house, two in a crawl space. It turns out that there was um, 11 women total who had gone missing since about 2007. So we have 11 women 
all of them black, missing since 2007, all dead, all here at the house at 12205 Imperial Avenue. The identifications of the women begins. Christy Dozier, Tashana Culver, Tonya Carmichael, LeSean DeLong, Michelle Mason. They hear the stories of others like Kim Smith. Kim Smith loved her father. She and her father took care of each other. He had a spinal injury and had trouble getting around, so Kim took, she looked after him. She, she would get, his, get him to his doctor's appointments. She would cook for him. But Kim was hanging out with the wrong crowd. She was smoking a lot of crack. And she was little by little not showing up as often. When she disappeared, her family didn't report her missing. He had a body that was right here. He had a body that was over here. He had a bag that was a body in there. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, hold on, look, I ain't finished. And he got a body behind the wall. Okay. Well, a lot of dirt back there, too. A lot of dirt all over that body. Next was Nancy Cobb. In April of 2009, Nancy went missing. Her family filed a missing persons report. They put up flyers all over the neighborhood at the local businesses, on telephone poles, everywhere. They were frantic to find her. They never did. They identify a Melda known as Amy Hunter. Amy Hunter adored books when she was a little girl. Her family called her a bookworm, and they said that she really loved reading the classics. But Amy's life would not have a storybook ending. By the time she was 14, she was pregnant, reportedly by a teacher who got her drunk at a party. Her baby was born deaf and with cerebral palsy, and Amy was devastated. And her friends said that she turned to crack cocaine as a sort of comfort, and it really took over her life. A life which ended inside the Soel House of Horrors. Soel, under interrogation, affects madness. It was all a dream, he says. He did not know real from unreal. They ask him about another woman identified, her name, Janice Webb. Janice Webb always loved her East Cleveland neighborhood where she grew up. It was home to her, and she loved her family. But unfortunately, she fell into the same trap that so many people in the neighborhood had fallen into, and that was the drugs. You got four bodies up, up top. You got one body in the basement. There's no more room in the house for bodies. So you got to go outside. This would make her most likely the last one. Not the last one. Talasia Fortson was Soel's 10th victim, a mother of three whose drug problems meant that her children had been taken away from her, her remains found buried in the garden. In early June of 2009, Talasia dropped by her adoptive mom's house to bring her some groceries, and then she left saying she'd be back, and she never came back. Her adopted mom reported her missing. Diane Turner, mother of six, was victim number 11. Her body remained unclaimed, unrecognized in the city morgue for nearly a year. She had been sober for almost two full years. Unfortunately, she never really learned how to be a good mom. And so the authorities said that she was a danger to her child, and they took her baby away when her baby was just four days old, and it devastated her. So pretty much then is when her family and friends say that Diane just gave up. Her body was found in a third floor bedroom of Anthony Soule's home at 12205 Imperial Avenue. The interrogation was not a difficult one if the target was to get a confession. So Al could hardly deny his guilt and any pretense of insanity soon disappears. For interrogators, the priority was to get the truth out of Anthony Soel, not to show how they were feeling, shock at hearing of how a serial killer had behaved quite so monstrously. As detectives, you have to remove the emotional side as far as getting 
looking at that person's life. It's important to know the facts and who that person is, who your victims are, and sometimes you get to know the families very well, and you feel it's a calling, it's a mission to be able to provide answers to what happened to their child or their loved one. So Elle had appeared as a party guy with a warm welcome to the women of Mount Pleasant, whose lives had taken a terrible turn for the worse, and they had trusted him. The mistake Soel had made in order for detectives to be led to a macabre mausoleum at 12.205 was simple. He allowed one victim too many to escape. That was Anthony Soule's killer's mistake. He let one of his victims get too close to a window, and she did what she had to to save her life. She jumped out that second story window. She's the one who got away. And that's what it took to get Anthony Soule finally arrested, finally stopped from his killing spree. Campaigners argued in 2018 that it was a killing spree which could and should have been stopped after the first report of a woman who had gone missing. And again, after women had lived to tell the tale of torture inside 12205. It was a sobering moment for Cleveland to realize that 11 citizens could go missing and nobody could make the connection that they were all in the same place, had all been killed by the same man. For a while, the house was left standing, a reminder of Sowell's crimes where artifacts of the women had been abandoned. Clothing and jewelry left behind in the upstairs apartment of his home. The decision was taken in 2010 to pull down 12205. People moved quickly to uh, get control of the house so that they could knock it down. And you know, within the year, the house was bulldozed and, and made into an empty lot. And um, there's been plans in the works for almost five years now to put some kind of memorial at that site. I think it left the whole community numb. You know, how could we let this happen? How could we let this happen? How indeed. So Elle had killed and raped raped and killed over a three-year period, at the end of which time his mistake was to run out of luck when a survivor convinced police to look under the trash inside 12205. Essentially, people like Anthony Sowell and other serial rapists that have since been discovered, they were, they were smarter than the police. They were smarter than the community. They knew that these women, and they, you know, the women probably knew in some ways too that nobody would care. Police had been warned about Soel on a number of occasions and even had the right to ask to go inside the home of the registered sex offender. But they did not dig too deeply into a man who lived in a neighborhood that officers did not like to frequent. Actually, sheriff's deputies visited his house and he had to check in regularly as a sex offender. And I think the same, the same week uh, as these bodies were discovered, they had checked in on him at his home and they had just never entered his home because that wasn't part of what they did. Um, if they did, they probably would have noticed something amiss or smelled the foul odor that neighbors had been complaining about for years, but couldn't really pinpoint um, you know, where it was coming from. The detective story which led police to the house of a serial killer does not reflect well on the Cleveland police force. That they got the final piece of the puzzle into the disappearance of women in Mount Pleasant was more about luck than judgment. Kidnap women too often, and eventually one will escape to raise an alarm that will finally be heard. She fell out the window upstairs on the second floor. Okay, are you there? She lay on the ground, by her neck. Are you? So El was given the death penalty in 2011. The sentence was never to be carried out. He died of natural causes in 2021.